Coming up next, a hearing concerning efforts by federal regulators and the blood industry to ensure the safety of the nation's blood supply. The House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, which is chaired by Congressman John Dingell, heard from Food and Drug Administration employees, medical doctors, and others. The uh, subcommittee comes to order. This morning, the subcommittee commences the second of a series of public hearings on the safety of the blood supply of this nation. This inquiry has its roots in the early mid 1980s, when the blood industry and the government failed to prevent transfusion of thousands of pints of blood and blood products infected with the AIDS virus. Today, however, our focus is on the present and not on the past. And this investigation will be directed towards answering the question of whether the blood supply is as safe as it could be or as it should be. And also ascertain what it is that we should do to assure that the best possible steps are taken to assure safety of all persons involved in this very important human activity. On this point, there's good news and there's bad news. The blood supply appears safer today than ever. In March of 1985, the first direct screening test for AIDS became generally available. An enhanced test for hepatitis B was finally instituted in 1987. And testing for hepatitis C began earlier this year. And despite the historic fears of the blood industry and some federal officials, all of this has been accomplished without creating any national shortages of blood. The bad news is that the American Red Cross, which collects over half of all the whole blood in the United States, has had serious and persistent problems with its procedures for testing and keeping track of this blood. According to inspection reports by the Food and Drug Administration and the Red Cross's own internal reports, various Red Cross collection centers have released infected blood, mixed up records, violated AIDS testing procedures, and failed to deter infected or undesirable donors. The FDA inspection of the Red Cross National Headquarters, which was completed on May 25 of this year, found that the Red Cross blood collection centers were not even complying with the Red Cross's own standard operating procedures. This in apparent violation of the September 1988 agreement between the Red Cross and the Food and Drug Administration. The subcommittee and the American people will want to know whether other collectors of whole blood or producers of blood products <coughs> differ from the same deficiencies or suffer from the same deficiencies as a Red Cross. On this score, the subcommittee will depend on the skill and dedication of FDA inspectors. I am heartened by the work that the FDA's field inspectors have done in this area in recent years even though the chair has continuously had to be critical of the inadequacy of resources, personnel, and money available to food and drug in carrying out its responsibilities. Ultimately, this investigation will attempt to determine whether the attitude of the blood bankers and the capability of the federal regulators have changed enough as a result of the AIDS debacle, and that both can respond quickly and effectively when the next infectious agent surfaces in the blood supply. To help us begin this assessment, our first panel consists of recognized and respected experts in the field of AIDS treatment, blood banking, and hemophilia. All are quite familiar with the response of the AIDS ec epidemic, and the chair looks forward to their very important testimony. Some other comments I think are appropriate at this time before we commence our proceeding. On July 10, the American Red Cross issued a, a press release that states the public can take assurance from the fact that only six cases of transfusion AIDS have been reported since the testing and screening have been instituted, according to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. Notwithstanding the problems that the Red Cross has experienced in keeping track of donors and units of blood after they've been tested, which will be explored today, the Red Cross statement was somewhat startling to the committee. 
The CDC monthly HIV AIDS report shows that so far this year, 76 people have been added to the list of transfusion AIDS cases each month. Why the disparity? We will inquire into. The committee has requested clarification of this matter immediately from the CDC, which was provided. CDC explained that the discrepancy between the large number of newly reported cases and the small number of confirmed cases since AIDS screening test was instituted in March 1985 is explained by two factors. First, the average incubation period for transfusion recipients between infection and diagnosis of AIDS is about seven years. Second, patients are not reportable to the CDC until they develop AIDS. Thus, it is obvious that the actual number of transfusion AIDS cases since the screening test uh, became available will not be known for some time. CDC is currently aware of 11 such cases almost double the number cited in the Red Cross press release. No one disputes the fact that the AIDS screening test has made the blood supply enormously safer than it was prior to 1985. The point of our inquiry is, and I want to make it clear, to find whether the blood industry, including the American Red Cross, is an important constituent thereof, is doing everything that it can to make the blood supply as safe as it ought to be. Statements which are made on this matter will only be helpful if they are made responsibly, and if they are made factually, and if they contribute to an intelligent discussion of what it is that needs to be done to assure that this nation has the safest and the best blood supply for the protection of all persons involved in and dependent upon that industry. It, uh, it, it appears that this will be one of the things with the, which the committee will have to address and the chair wants to make it plain that one of our purposes will be to see to it that this discussion in the committee and elsewhere is conducted responsibly with great attention not only to fact, but also to the best way in which the matter should be addressed. The statement of the, rather the letter from the Center for Disease Control will be inserted into the record at the appropriate point. The chair recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Bliley, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I commend you for calling this hearing to begin this subcommittee's examination of the safety of the nation's blood supply. I understand this is the first of a series of public hearings on this important, indeed, life or death issue. The safety of the blood supply should be one of paramount concern by the medical community. By the so-called blood industry, those who collect and sell blood and blood products and by those who regulate the industry. But is it, or was it back in 1983 when the Centers for Disease Control warnings that we would have a disaster on our hands if AIDS surrogate testing were not implemented apparently went unheeded? The questions raised are quite serious. Did blood go untested by over two years despite the availability of tests that could have detected the presence of the AIDS virus? or at the very least detected those donors at high risk for the disease? Was the decision not to test made for purely economic reasons at a cost of countless lives and of thousands or perhaps tens of thousands of blood transfusion recipients now testing positive for the AIDS virus? Was there a conspiracy of silence by the blood industry and its regulators to hide the problem of transfusion aid? and to pass the buck to one another in the hope the problem would somehow just go away. These are just a few of the many, many questions I look forward to having answered as these hearings progress. Mr. Chairman, I do want to point out that the problems we are today highlighting deal primarily with situations that have occurred in the past. Although I understand our FDA witness will present testimony that problems still exist, it is important for us to recognize the impact that these hearings may have on public confidence in the blood supply. We must seek to get the facts without at the same time inducing panic. We in Congress have a great deal of power to influence public opinion, and we must be careful not to abuse that power. I want to join with you, Mr. Chairman, and with my colleagues in welcoming our witnesses to this hearing 
It appears that most of you have been quite courageous in going against the grain and challenging the practices of the blood industry in the areas of testing and donor screening. I look forward to your testimony and to your ideas on how this subcommittee and its parent committee can work to develop solutions to the extremely troubling questions and problems raised by this investigation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks the gentleman. Gentleman from Oregon. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, for taking on this uh, uh, issue and also for the very responsible way in which I think you've addressed uh, these questions so that the public understands that the blood supply is safer than uh, it's been, but also that uh, it's important to look at areas where we could do better. The record shows, in my view, that segments of the blood industry dragged their feet on safety issues in the early 1980s and continue to do so today. Earlier this week, the public learned that FDA inspectors said the American Red Cross National Headquarters failed to disclose to the FDA 228 instances in which people contracted AIDS or other infections through blood transfusions. Instead of taking direct responsibility and saying that these reports should have been made to the FDA and will be made in the future, the Red Cross stonewalled the issue and said that such reports were, quote, not required. Now, they're technically correct that they don't have to pass on AIDS cases, but they do have to pass on cases where there are errors. And it seems to me that the position that they've taken, in addition, that the buck should simply be passed on to individual physicians is not the best possible health policy for the future. The Red Cross in a statement also suggests that the problems of the early 80s do not exist today. They believe they're in compliance with their 1988 agreement with the FDA to improve their blood supply operations nationwide. But the subcommittee has documents that indicate that safety problems continue to persist today. For example, an error report concerning bacterial contamination where the recipient subsequently died was discovered in January of 1990 and as of May of this year was not reported to the FDA. The report was not even received by the American Red Cross Regulatory Affairs Office until a month after its initial discovery. So the notion that these problems are just matters of, of yesteryear is not one that this member is yet convinced of. The final point that I'd want to mention, Mr. Chairman, is that the slow response of some in the blood industry in the past is undoubtedly going to affect health policy in this country for many years to come. And I'm concerned that if blood bankers don't move to address the problems outlined by our witnesses today, we may be back looking at some of these continuing problems well into the next century. Mr. Chairman, again, I commend you for this important inquiry and look forward to working with you. Chair, Chair thanks, gentlemen. The Chair recognizes now the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McMillan. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and commend you for uh, taking uh, urgent action in holding these hearings. Um, I'll be brief. Um, we all know that uh, whole blood and its derivatives are absolutely dispensable, indispensable in modern medicine. Um, it's provided commercially and voluntarily in my own community. Um, Charlotte, North Carolina um, is dependent upon a major regional Red Cross blood center, which uh, in the past has had a, a good reputation. I hope that um, is the case. The integrity of supply is absolutely essential. Um, there can be no compromise on that. And the purpose of these hearings uh, today and those that will follow will be to identify uh, any real problems that have existed in the past or exist uh, at present. And if so, um, they're intolerable. And this committee is in a position to recommend uh, immediate action to deal with it if, in fact, uh, um, the evidence uh, is presented that would indicate that uh, such action is in order. I appreciate the uh, forthcoming testimony of our witnesses today and look forward to uh, to your testimony. I yield back the balance of my time. Chair, thanks to the distinguished gentleman. Uh, the chair recognizes now the gentleman from Georgia. 
Um, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Rowan. And I commend you for this hearing also. It's certainly distressing to me to realize that in the early 1980s, when there was increasing evidence that um, AIDS was spread through transfusion, that for whatever reason, cost or fear of losing donors, uh, the issue was not addressed scientifically. And um, there were many people apparently who were infected that would not have been affected had the issue been addressed scientifically. Of course, what we need to be concerned with now is the future reliability of the blood supply in our country, and uh, I hope that we will get information out of this hearing that will focus attention on that and what we need to do in order to ensure uh, that to the extent possible we do not have blood that uh, transmits disease from one person to another in the event of transfusions. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks the gentleman. The chair recognizes now the uh, gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't think I have to remind anyone on the committee or, or here that uh, this is a very, very sensitive issue, uh, one that uh, clearly has to be handled uh, in a manner that will not uh, frighten uh, the general public, uh, that gets at the facts of what has happened in the past, uh, what uh, corrections ha have been made uh, to, uh, to uh, change the, the uh, bad practices in the past. Uh, I know we have a great deal of media interest today. Uh, would simply uh, admonish uh, those in the media uh, that uh, this will be a series of hearings uh, on the blood supply. This is the first uh, hearing of, of uh, perhaps four uh, that this subcommittee will be undertaking, and uh, how critically important it is to, uh, to place uh, a highest value uh, we can on accuracy, uh, on a lack of uh, sensationalism, on trying to get at the facts and at the same time give the public the information that they need to make a responsible uh, decision in this area. Uh, I know that the chair is uh, pledged to uh, that effort. Uh, the uh, way that this has been handled as usual has been uh, above uh, uh, any question of, uh, uh, of uh, accurate, uh, leading to an accurate uh, uh, conclusion as to, as to how we deal with this issue. Uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing from our distinguished panel uh, and uh, in a later time, uh, the Red Cross and uh, other uh, agencies that uh, deal with this uh, very uh, difficult uh, problem and uh, certainly uh, look forward to uh, participating uh, in those hearings. And I yield back the balance of my time. Chair, thanks. Gen gentlewoman from uh, Illinois, Ms. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me add um, uh, my uh, commendations, too, to those who commend you for holding this very timely hearing at this point in time. Mr. Chairman, people with severe illnesses come from dozens of other countries in our world to the United States for treatment because they know that our medical technology and expertise is among the world's best. Little do they know, however, that there is also a certain percentage of a chance of leaving the United States with more than a cure. In fact, even perhaps with life-threatening disease. It's come to our attention that our once invaluable blood supply has become susceptible to impurities and contamination. Of course, such instances are far from the norm and there is no need for panic. However, there is a serious need for precautions in order to avoid widespread contamination. If we don't tighten our standards for, for purity in our blood supply now, we would be leaving the door open for a spread of disease that could occur in a relatively short time and have far-reaching consequences. Screening pro programs ought constantly to be adjusted upward to reflect the state of the art and understanding of the possible contaminants as well as the available safeguards against them. Screening for both HIV-1 and HIV-2, for example, must be as sophisticated as possible and be institutionalized as standard operating procedure without any kinds of exceptions. If additional testing costs, uh, time, and delay are necessary, then so be it. This is simply too serious a matter to cut any corners. Our committee, as well as Congress as a whole, has devoted a great deal of resources to AIDS-related issues such as research and development, testing, treatment, confidentiality, and various legal ramifications. However, those offers are futile uh, without devoting ourselves first and foremost to prevention. Unwitting transmission of AIDS-related viruses through blood transfusions and other blood usages can be absolutely prevented. Our job today is to better understand the problems and the preventive measures, uh, measures that are at our disposal. Mr. Chairman, I certainly look forward to today's illuminations of the status of our nation's blood supply, and hopefully we'll be left with a clear picture so that 
we can uh, guard against and be told how to go about doing so. I, again, thank you for calling this hearing, and I'm certainly very interested in what our witness is going to say to us and yield back the balance of our time. Chair, thanks, the gentlewoman. The uh, chair now expresses, first of all, the apology of the chair to our panel. Uh, I, we are trying to, at the same time, go to conference with the Senate and to write clean air legislation in conference with the other body. And for that reason, I was delayed. I want to also express to all of you our appreciation here on the committee for your appearance and for your assistance to us. We are very grateful to you. And we view your help as being central to our ability to understand the issues and try and assure that this, the questions now before the subcommittee are handled in the most responsible and effective and capable manner. Gentlemen, we will start on your left with Dr. Conant going across to Mr. Eckert, Dr. Engelman, uh, Mr. Brownstein, and Dr. Ratnoff in that order as we proceed. Gentlemen, the uh, committee, since its inception, has received all testimony of witnesses under oath. Do any of you object to appearing under oath? Gentlemen, the uh, chair advises also that since that is the practice of the committee, you are each of you entitled to be advised by counsel during your appearance here. Do any of you so desire? Very well. Then, for your information, however, to inform you of the powers of the committee, the subcommittee, and limitations thereon, as well as your rights as you appear here before you, copy uh, before us, copies of the rules of the committee, the, the House, and the subcommittee are there before you. Gentlemen, if you have no objection to appearing under oath, would you each please rise and raise your right hand? Gentlemen, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Okay. Gentlemen, you may each consider yourself to be under oath. Dr. Conant, if you would commence, we will recognize you for your statement. <clears throat> Congressman Dingell, the distinguished members of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigation, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am Marcus Conant, a professor at the University of California Medical Center, San Francisco. I co-chair the California State AIDS Leadership Committee, and more importantly, I care for about 5,000 men and women in San Francisco who are infected with the human immunodeficiency virus that causes AIDS. I first started seeing patients with AIDS in the spring of 1981, before the disease was even named AIDS, and have been intimately associated with the epidemic since that time. Uh, I started the first multidisciplinary AIDS clinic in the United States at the University of California in 1981. I started the organization that became the San Francisco AIDS Foundation in 1982. And I obtained funds from the state of California to establish the AIDS Clinical Research Centers at the Universities of California in 1983. Colleagues and I at the university publicly called on blood bankers to institute surrogate testing of the blood two months after the first case of transfusion-associated AIDS was reported. Our, our call to the public was in February of 1983. The AIDS epidemic, as you know, was first recognized in Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco in the spring of 1981. And within a year, Dr. Bill Darrow at the CDC had identified that this was a new sexually transmitted disease. We still didn't know the cause, but Dr. Darrow had clearly identified that the disease was being spread by sexual contact. At about the time of that revelation, hemophiliacs were being reported uh, who had contracted this new disease but who had not engaged in homosexual practices. The first three such cases were reported in the MMWR in the summer of 1982, and speculation began at that time that this new disease might be bloodborne as well as sexually transmitted and might be transmitted in the same way as hepatitis B. That supposition was supported by the report of IV drug users developing AIDS in August and September of 1982. The vertical transmission of AIDS from an infected mother to her child in utero 
in October of 1982, and finally the first reported case of transfusion-associated AIDS in an infant uh, in San Francisco uh, in December of 1982. And that case is illustrative. The child was born healthy but needed exchange transfusions. About a year later began to suffer from an unusual disease, Mycobacter avia metacelluliare, which is a disease seen in AIDS patients. When we started looking for risk factors, could find none, but they found that the child had had 19 exchange transfusions. When they went back and looked at the donors of those transfusions, it was found that one of the men was totally asymptomatic at the time he gave the blood in the spring of 1981, but was dying of AIDS when the child was found to be sick in the fall of 1982, telling us that in fact we could have asymptomatic donors who were infectious. The CDC responded to this uh, information by calling a meeting on January the 3rd of 1983 and at that meeting they had members from the blood industry, the hemophiliac industry, the plasma industry, they had representatives from the gay community. Uh, unfortunately they did not have representatives from the general public who would be receiving the blood. Dr. Spiro pointed out at that meeting that surrogate testing could be used to identify 80 to 95 percent of the patients with AIDS and that surrogate testing could be used to eliminate two-thirds of the people whose behavior had put them at risk for being infected with the AIDS virus. Blood bankers were reticent to implement these tests and while they agreed at the CDC meeting that something needed to be done, no consensus could be reached as to what should be done. Two weeks later, the blood industry issued a joint statement and made two specific recommendations. One, that donors be educated as to who was at risk for this new disease so they could self-defer, and that doctors be educated to use less blood in the face of this new threat. Unfortunately, neither of those recommendations were ever implemented. In March of 1983, the Public Health Service again reiterated those two requests and suggested that testing be done of donor screening and screening of product to see if the new procedures were working. Again, these recommendations were never implemented. Finally, on March the 24th, 1983, Dr. Petrucciani of the Food and Drug Administration issued two sets of regulations, one for whole blood industry and one for the plasma industry with very lenient and vague recommendations for the whole blood industry, slightly more stringent recommendations for the plasma industry, even though both are simply arms of the same, of the same industry. And while I have no direct evidence for this, it would appear that the recommendations issued by the Food and Drug Administration were the recommendations from the blood industry itself and were not concerned with the evidence of how to stop transfusion-associated AIDS uh, to the general public. Unfortunately, these minor steps were the only steps taken during the period of 1983 and 84 to prevent transfusion-associated AIDS. And as the number of cases continued to grow, and you will remember that the numbers were being reported on an exponential, Innovative techniques to use surrogate screening, such as helper suppressor T cell ratios, which Dr. Engelman was doing at Stanford, uh, hepatitis B core testing, which was finally implemented in San Francisco in May of 1984, were not implemented by the national uh, blood industry. I have suggested the chronology of what occurred until testing became available. Um, with, a, with an AIDS antibody test in March of 1985. But if I may, uh, let me speculate for a moment as to why this tragedy occurred, a tragedy which has resulted in some 12 to 20,000 Americans being infected uh, with the AIDS virus. The blood bank industry is totally dependent on voluntary free donation of blood by altruistic citizens anxious to help their fellow man. While blood bankers do much good, it is also irrefutable that if donors do not come to blood centers, there will be no product to sell to hospitals and patients. 
Blood bankers were terrified that if they questioned donors about high-risk behaviors, donors would cease to present themselves voluntarily to blood centers. Furthermore, if blood banks did surrogate testing, they would have to tell many donors that they had evidence of hepatitis B infection, and this meant the donor was at risk for exposure to the AIDS virus. Blood bankers feared that both of these steps would threaten the financial viability of the blood bank. In 1983, blood banking organizations failed us by coordinating their efforts. Their public statements was that the blood was safe, that the chance of getting uh, AIDS from a transfusion was less than a one in a million, and yet the same gentleman who chaired the Joint Statement Committee in January of 1983 at the same time was communicating by memo to his own Committee on Transfusion uh, Transmitted Disease and stating that he was certain there would be more cases of transfusion associated AIDS, that he believed that at this time the most we could do is to buy time, that we were reluctant to do anything publicly for fear that legal authorities uh, would use the this information for their own uh, benefit, and that we should continue to act together uh, in an effort to control the situation. This is in February of 1983. So you're having public statements that the blood is safe and private statements from blood bankers that they're certain that there will be more cases and they have to act together to contain uh, the, the epidemic. The Centers for Disease Control had identified the cause of AIDS and had irrefutable evidence of transfusion-associated AIDS, and yet they were unwilling to use the power of their agency to move public policy. This could have been achieved by weekly reports of the increasing number of transfusion-associated AIDS cases and, reported, uh, and reports of steps that could be taken to identify individuals at high risk by history and laboratory tests. So the blood industry failed us the CDC failed us, and finally, the FDA failed us. The regulatory agency charged with overseeing the blood banking industry published recommendations that at best were nothing more than watered down recommendations from the blood banking industry itself, and at no time attempted to bring into the review process individuals without ties to the blood bank industry who were expert in evaluation and treatment of patients with AIDS. Our representatives from the hospital industry, American Medicine, are indeed the general public who would be receiving the blood that was drawn from infected donors. Let me close by telling you why this matter is of such great importance. It is tragic that we have 12 to 20,000 Americans infected with AIDS as a consequence of the blood industry drawing donors who could have been deferred. But there's a greater tragedy. And the greater tragedy is the fact that the blood industry could have used its tremendous pressure to educate the American people about AIDS, how this disease is transmitted, who is at risk, how to protect yourself, and why you should not donate blood if you fall into a high-risk group. So did not only did the AIDS epidemic spread by transfusion, to individuals because we were drawing from infected donors, but because the blood industry failed to go public and to educate the general public, we literally have tens of thousands of young men and women in this country today who could have received information in 1983 and 1984 who would deprive that information until 1985 and 1986, at which time they became infected. So not only are we going to lose a few thousand people from transfusion-associated AIDS, we're going to lose tens of thousands of people because the blood industry did not join with other institutions in educating the American public. Thank you. Doctor, the committee thanks you. Mr. Eckert. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for inviting me to appear today. <coughs> My name is Ross D. Eckert. I am Boswell Professor of Economic and Legal Organization at Claremont McKenna College and member of the Graduate Faculty in Economics of the Claremont Colleges. I have published two articles and co-authored a book on blood banking and blood safety. I have made several presentations to meetings of the American Association of Blood Banks, which are listed on the CV that I submitted to the committee. In 1987, I was appointed by Secretary Bowen to a four-year term as a member 
of the FDA's Blood Products Advisory Committee. I appear today in my private capacity as a non-medical expert. No official support or endorsement by the FDA is intended or should be inferred. I have written mainly about the nonprofit blood banking industry to which I will confine my remarks, and I have submitted a longer statement for the record. Blood is not as safe today as it can be. We know that some dangerous donors still give, and that the tests used by blood banks for HIV and hepatitis viruses have error rates. We have been reminded in the news this week that blood banks also can occasionally make clerical and other errors. But such errors are probably a small problem compared to the ongoing casualties resulting from inadequate screening of donors throughout blood banking. In 1988, it was estimated that as many as 460 recipients of properly tested blood will be infected with HIV each year. I estimate that for the past several years, about 500 patients a day were infected with hepatitis viruses, and that about 4,000 of them per year will develop fatal cirrhosis within five to 10 years. Losing 4,000 people per year is about like losing a fully loaded DC-10 each month. The response of blood banks to the threat of transfusion AIDS was unnecessarily slow. That slow response had several causes. In most communities, blood banks are monopolies or cartels. So patients lack competitive market processes for protection. Blood banking, unique among industries, is shielded from strict liability in tort or contract. And industry custom is an absolute defense to negligence. Patients are poorly informed about blood safety and rely on the FDA to protect them. Some patients may take fewer precautions in the expectation that the FDA is protecting them. But the FDA relies heavily on blood banks for advice in setting, of the, setting some of their most important care levels. And the three blood collecting organizations often coordinate their policies. Without sufficient competition, liability, or regulation, the incentives of blood bankers to provide the service quality that consumers want are relatively weak. The best way to improve safety is by more careful donor screening. Our donor pool of about 9 million persons, each of whom gives only 1.5 times per year on the average, is too large and spreads too much disease. Needed are donor registries, limited panels of low-risk repeat donors who are in good health to begin with, who maintain their health, and who are willing to give a more detailed medical history and have their blood tested more carefully than at present. In 1976, a report to the Congress by the GAO presented evidence that registries in the 1970s at several hospitals improved safety. A test of the experience with a registry using a small, selected, targeted, and tested donor pool at the Mayo Clinic came to the same conclusion. Registries in some cities might lead to paying safe donors to donate more frequently. I think that we should be willing to buy safe blood if it saves lives. But the blood bankers have, have opposed even experimenting with registries. The Presidential Commission on the HIV Epidemic urged the FDA to fund a six-month study of registries by an independent organization that would report to the FDA and the Congress. I urge you to consider that excellent recommendation. I serve, as I said, on the FDA Blood Products Advisory Committee. From my vantage point on that committee for over two years, I have watched the information that the FDA obtains through the advisory committee process. That process is heavily skewed in, flav in favor of the blood banking industry over consumers. Individual blood banks and their trade associations regularly appear to pre present information to the committee and to the agency. Most consumers are healthy, do not expect to be transfused in a given year, and know next to nothing about blood banking or the FDA's regulatory processes. Thus, it is not surprising that the FDA gets more information from suppliers than from consumers. The FDA cannot make balanced decisions unless it gets balanced advice. Certain structural changes in the committee would increase the information that the FDA gets from consumers. First, eliminate the two non-voting positions on the committee. Second, give the consumer representative a vote Third, appoint physicians and specialties who treat patients having disorders that require heavy use of blood or blood products and who therefore constitute an effective early warning system for the general public. 
Fourth, hold the number of voting members who are blood bankers to just one. Fifth, let the committee be chaired by someone other than a blood banker. And sixth, continue to appoint an economist who can take a society-wide perspective of the, change, of the effects of changes in blood safety. In making these proposals, I emphasize that I am not criticizing any of my individual colleagues on the committee now or in the past. They are all impressive professionals in the fields that the FDA has selected. In future hearings, I hope that you will learn what it is about the structure of incentives within the FDA that has caused the rate of transfusion casualties from hepatitis and AIDS to be so high, and why the surrogate testing matter was handled so terribly. I hope you will recommend changes in the structure of the advisory committee or other measures so that the advice that the FDA receives is fairly balanced. I think those changes are worth ma making, but I do not believe that they would solve as much of the problem as more competition and product liability would. I hope you can learn from the blood banking organizations why they issue product statements jointly rather than independently and why their one in a million statement of, risk of the risk of transfusion aids in early 1983 was egregiously low. I cannot help but wonder what reprimand the FDA would have issued had a similar exaggeration been made by one of the pharma pharmaceutical firms that it regulates. Finally, I hope you will explore in future hearings how the blood bankers and the FDA intend to cope with the next lethal bloodborne virus or other agent when it arrives. Do they have a plan? other than primarily to wait for better medical tests to be developed, as they did in the case of hepatitis and AIDS. If not, then our society probably faces more rough times ahead. Thank you, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Mr. Eckert, the committee thanks you. Dr. Engelman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Ed Engelman. I am a member of the faculty of the Departments of Pathology and Medicine at Stanford University. <coughs> And I'm also a blood banker, and I'm the medical director of the <coughs> excuse me, Stanford University Blood Bank. <coughs> in July of 1983, we instituted uh, surrogate testing of our blood donors in an effort to reduce the transfusion transmission of AIDS. Uh, at that time, we were the, ours was the first blood bank in the country to institute such testing, although at the time we thought that the need was apparent, and we were quite surprised that the rest of the industry not only did not follow our lead, but uh, criticized us for instituting such testing. We believe that the evidence shows clearly that had such testing been introduced around the country, and particularly in the high-risk areas, uh, the number of AIDS transfusion cases would have been markedly reduced. I have provided the committee with a, a complete transcript of my testimony and will not uh, take more of the necessary time here, but I do ask that, uh, that the committee review it in its entirety uh, in the future. In any event, um, we believe that the incident of the failure to institute surrogate testing for AIDS in 1983 and 84 does not represent an isolated uh, problem since there have been several other uh, problems and failure to institute testing by the blood banking industry both before and since. Uh, perhaps a good example is the example of cytomegalovirus, or CMV for short, for which a simple, inexpensive, and specific test was available as early as 1980. Uh, the evidence that the use of this test would prevent transfusion transmitted CMV disease was published in that year, and yet it took at least five years before the industry even acknowledged the potential importance of using this test. Even today, uh, the use of the CMV test is not mandated for uh, patients who could benefit by CMV-free blood. In any event, in trying to evaluate the reasons for the failure of the blood banking industry uh, to adopt surrogate testing for AIDS uh, and perhaps for others, other uh, infectious agents, we have come up with a series of reasons, many of which I think are familiar to you. But they basically boil down to a failure to acknowledge the extent of the AIDS epidemic, an extraordinary resistance to change and criticism, a refusal to accept imperfect solutions to urgent problems, and a lack of insightful leadership within the blood banking community and government agencies. As to what we 
believe can and should be done now. Um, we are concerned that while the safety of today's blood supply is much, uh, much improved over past years, that among the reasons for this safety and the reason why we're using so many more tests uh, is uh, public pressure and perhaps fear of litigation on the part of blood banking uh, institutions rather than uh, insight uh, by the industry into the real needs for the industry. Uh, if this is true, then we have much to fear in the future. I hope that it is not. But uh, one of the ideas that we have recently uh, submitted is the idea that the industry in general and, and the venerable institutions such as the Red Cross in particular uh, should be subjected to some form of, of arm's length review uh, at the professional uh, level. Uh, until now, uh, the Red Cross and, and, uh, and blood banks in general have reviewed themselves. And it is unfortunate that we don't have a blue ribbon group of professionals that can uh, provide a more objective evaluation than has been carried out in the past. In addition, we believe that physicians and nurses and healthcare professionals in general have in the past been extremely poorly trained and educated uh, in the field of transfusion medicine. And we believe that by improving the education of our uh, physicians and nurses, uh, that the consumers uh, and the professionals uh, will, uh, will be more cautious and more knowledgeable in the future. I think I'll stop there and uh, yield. Thank you. Dr. Engelman, we thank you. Dr. Brownstein. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Alan Brownstein, and I am the executive director of the National Hemophilia Foundation. I've held that position since 1981 and have seen a tremendous tragedy occur to the many individuals with hemophilia because of the contamination of the blood supply by the AIDS virus. Mr. Chairman, we deeply appreciate the opportunity to, to testify on these important issues and to share our experience with you. NHF believes that the safety of the nation's blood supply is measured by the health and well-being of the people who use it. Our confidence in, this, in that safety was shaken greatly in the 1980s. We hope that the result of your investigation will be a renewed faith in the safety of blood for everyone. Hemophilia is an inherited defect of the blood clotting mechanism that affects 20,000 people, almost all males. Deficiencies in factor VIII, hemophilia A, and factor IX, hemophilia B, are the most prevalent. And a deficiency in either can cause severe bleeding problems. An individual with severe hemophilia may bleed spontaneously without trauma 30 to 50 times a year. Each person with severe hemophilia A uses an average of 50 to 80,000 units of clotting factor each year. Because this clotting factor is produced from the blood plasma of many donors, well over 100,000 donors uh, per year, uh, these individuals are exposed to many transfusion-born risks. For example, hepatitis is also a major risk for the individual with hemophilia. In July of 82, CDC reported three cases of AIDS among hemophilia patients. It is now estimated that 50% of all persons with hemophilia are HIV positive. Seropositivity rates for persons with severe hemophilia are about 70%. The total number of, of patients diagnosed with AIDS, uh, according to CDC, as of May of 1990, is now 1,424. Of these, 900, 950 have already died. Children are also vulnerable, as 119 of these cases are under the age of 13. The impact of this disease on people with hemophilia, their families and loved ones, has been enormous. While we are optimistic about the potential of new drugs to treat AIDS, nonetheless, half of our population is HIV positive and faces an uncertain future. In addition to the loss of life caused by AIDS among people with hemophilia, there are other consequences. As we have seen from the tragic events surrounding the life of Ryan White, people with hemophilia have been subject to discrimination at school or at work. 
Another result has been the enormous increase in the cost of treating hemophilia. New clotting factors, which are viral inactivated uh, to protect against HIV, cost substantially more than previous products. In just a year and a half, price increases of 600 to 800 percent were typical. Since July of 1982, when I was first informed by Dr. Bruce Evett of CDC that three people with hemophilia had been diagnosed with AIDS, NHF has been aggressive in its efforts to assure a safe blood supply, to get effective treatments that are free of viruses, and to provide assistance to our community. We immediately alerted our chapters and health professionals about the presence of AIDS. By October of 1982, even though definitive data linking AIDS to the blood supply was lacking, we felt that steps needed to be taken to protect the blood supply until it could be established that it was free of the HIV virus. We recommended that vigorous steps be taken to exclude donors who were known to be at high risk of contracting AIDS. We distributed this position widely in November of 1982. However, we were deeply disappointed that no public policy emerged at that time. Mr. Chairman, NHF was incensed that there was a lack of willingness to officially acknowledge the potential seriousness of this situation. We urged the Public Health Service to address this problem as soon as possible. Unfortunately, their meeting on uh, January 4, 1983, did not lead to any new policies. In fact, a number of blood bank executives who attended that meeting objected to any course of action unless definitive scientific uh, information was provided. Then, the NHF uh, convened an emergency meeting of its uh, prestigious Medical and Scientific Advisory Council on January 14, 1983, to develop a position on AIDS in relation to blood product safety. MASAC, as we call it, reviewed the data that had been reported at the January 4th meeting and recommended that it was important to screen and exclude high-risk donors from the blood and plasma supply used in the production of material prepared for the treatment of hemophilia. We also called for evaluation and implementation of surrogate laboratory tests that would identify individuals at high risk of AIDS transmission. Our recommendations were immediately accepted by the blood fractionation industry, but not the blood banking community with respect to donor screening. Within two months, however, the Public Health Service issued recommendations embodying the concepts endorsed by our MASAC, and shortly thereafter, the voluntary blood banks followed suit. Thus, NHF was the first national body to spearhead a broad-based awareness of the need for safeguarding uh, the uh, nation's blood supply, because in a very real way, we served as an early warning system to the general public uh, due to our vast exposure to blood and blood products. Since then, we have issued policies that were followed by the industry that led to numerous product withdrawals, screening donors for HIV-related symptoms, and, and ALT testing. By mid-August, we will be issuing recommendations regarding hepatitis uh, uh, C uh, testing, uh, and we will also be examining HIV, too. What can be done to make sure that the blood supply is not similarly affected in the future? Based on the experience we have over the last several years, we have several recommendations to make in closing. First, it is important to strengthen the FDA's regulatory role over new technology blood products. We believe you must give FDA authority to monitor products once they have been approved for sale so that the long-term effects can be assessed. Additionally, FDA must have the resources both financially and human to fulfill its mandates. Only then will it be able to speed the review and approval of new non-human source blood products as well as new viral inactivation methods. Second, the nation needs to devote greater resources to assuring safety in the collection of our blood supply. This means that CDC needs to conduct more epidemiologic studies that will lead to the development of more effective donor screening criteria. Also, FDA needs to expedite the review and assessment of improved methods of testing blood. And finally, we need to take steps to address the cost issues that have arisen for hemophilia treatment. Not only must the reimbursement system recognize the changing technologies when they occur, we also need to protect individuals with chronic conditions such as hemophilia from discrimination in the insurance market. Mr. Chairman, 
Again, I want to express my thanks to you and the members of the subcommittee for holding these important hearings and conducting this investigation. A great tragedy has occurred with the contamination of the blood supply by the HIV virus. This must not happen again, and we urge Congress to take the steps necessary to ensure that we never have a repeat of this tragic circumstance. The National Hemophilia Foundation pledges its, uh, it pledges its full resources to work with you. And I would be pleased to answer any questions from any members of this subcommittee. I thank you. Dr. Brownstein, or Mr. Brownstein, the committee thanks you for your very helpful testimony. Uh, Dr. Ratnoff, you do not have a prepared statement. Uh, would you like to make a comment at this time, or would you like me to have Mr. Sims ask you several questions? Well, I would like to say just a, a short. Uh, you are welcome for that. So, I just wanted to make sure we were proceeding the way you found best. I, I had guessed that there would be great reiteration between what I would say and what previous speakers would say, and therefore I, I wanted to be able to trim my sail. Doctor, you are certainly welcome and you are recognized. Uh, I'm a hematologist with about 40 years of experience in the care of hemophiliacs, in teaching about hemophiliacs, and in doing research into hemophilia and allied uh, diseases. Uh, I've uh, uh, done this in the setting of an academic career. I've been president of the American Society of Hematology. I've been chairman of the National Institutes of Health Hematology Study Section. Well, when we talk about hemophilia, we're using the term quite loosely. There are at least two such uh, disorders that make up uh, most of the cases uh, of hereditary bleeding disease, classic hemophilia, and Christmas disease. Uh, these are clinically uh, very, very similar, but different proteins are defective or missing from the patient's blood. Uh, the severity varies from family to family, and it's only in the severe cases that we uh, see the very heavy blood usage that Mr. Brownstein was talking about. Uh, Dr. Bruce Evett of the CDC was kind enough uh, to uh, uh, invite me to the first uh, public health service meeting uh, on AIDS and hemophilia uh, that was held just after the publication in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report about which you heard. Uh, at that meeting, it was suggested that the, perhaps the patient with hemophilia who had come down with AIDS had some impairment of their immune defenses, uh, as had been recognized in other patients with AIDS. Uh, armed with this, I went uh, back uh, to Cleveland and did a study which I will try to uh, explain uh, in uh, brief. Up until 1960s, about 1963 or so, uh, both hemophilia and Christmas disease were treated by the infusion of whole plasma. Thus, a patient who came in with a bleeding episode, perhaps bleeding into a joint, might be transfused with the plasma of eight donors, or six donors, or four donors. All volunteers are all presumably uh, healthy. In the mid-1960s, uh, two types of concentrated uh, clotting factors for treatment of classic hemophilia became available. One so-called cryoprecipitate uh, was a uh, concentrate of antihemophilic factor or factor VIII that was frozen down, uh, thawed when needed. Uh, one might need uh, for uh, somebody who had bled into a joint the uh, frozen uh, factor VIII from perhaps 30 or 40 donors. And in the case of a patient undergoing surgery, one might use as many as 600 or 800 donors or more. Uh, these donors, again, were uh, uh, volunteers. And the pooling of the plasma fraction, the factor VIII, uh, occurred only at the time uh, that uh, the patient was transfused. Now, at about the same time, uh, several uh, uh, commercial manufacturers introduced uh, freeze-dried concentrates of factor A. That is, 
uh, factor VIII would be purified considerably more than in the cryoprecipitates I mentioned, uh, but purified from the pool plasma of perhaps as many as 20,000 or more donors. This is truly a case of which uh, one uh, rotten apple gets the whole barrel. Uh, these uh, concentrates had the great virtue that they could uh, be uh, frozen, uh, uh, dried, and the powder that resulted, this is the same process with which you make uh, uh, freeze-dried coffee, that powder could then be dissolved at the time the patient needed to be transfused. This allowed enormously greater mobility for the patient with hemophilia. He could uh, travel away from his home area because he no longer was bound to the hospital in order to get his treatment. Uh, work uh, records improved, school records improved. It wasn't, therefore, very surprising that when the epidemic of AIDS appeared, that the greatest possible resistance to change in therapy from these lyophilized preparations, the freeze-dried preparations, to the cryoprecipitates uh, occurred both in the patients themselves and in their treaters. Uh, neither group wanted to see uh, then uh, uh, relapse back to uh, the uh, being tied to a hospital in order to be cared for. Uh, the, at that time, we uh, did a study which demonstrated, in fact, that my prediction was correct. Those patients treated with the freeze-dried fractions of factor VIII had a very high proportion uh, impaired immune defenses, such as would make them liable for AIDS. And in the contrary wise, those who had been treated with single units uh, were, appeared to be uh, uh, essentially uh, free of these Im impairments. Uh, we also did a study uh, to see uh, what effect previous treatment with these freeze-dried materials uh, had on our hemophiliacs, reason, realizing full well that if you don't know a disease exists, you can't protect against it. Uh, I happened to have a collection of plasmas from patients and from control individuals that were frozen down in our freezers. We, uh, with the help of the CDC, uh, we were able then to study these. We coded these so that uh, people's confidentiality would be uh, maintained, uh, coded them so that the CDC wouldn't know whether they were testing a control normal or a hemophiliac and what treatment the hemophiliac had had. And the result of this study was that uh, beginning in 1980, uh, we were able to find uh, uh, antibodies against the uh, AIDS virus in uh, patients, and by 1984, 78 percent of our patients uh, treated with the lyophilized freeze-dried material were positive. In contrast, those who had been treated with the individual donor system of cryoprecipitate did not have any such infection. Uh, since that time, the, uh, the uh, manufacturers of factor VIII have learned uh, how better to uh, uh, screen potential donors uh, and reject those who might be uh, uh, transmitting uh, AIDS. But better than that, they have learned uh, how to uh, treat uh, plasma and its fractions, not whole blood, but plasma and its fractions in such a way as uh, to destroy the virus of, of uh, AIDS. This is by heat and by the use of organic solvents. Unfortunately, this has not been that all that successful in the treatment of hepatitis, which remains a serious problem. I think I'm going to stop at that point so that I don't reiterate much, too much of what's been said. Well, Dr. Ratnoff, I don't want you to think that we want you to quit. 
and we, we want you to say what you think is going to be helpful to you and helpful to us. Um, gentlemen of the panel, the, there's a vote on the floor that I have to go over and make. I've, I've asked Mr. Wyden to go over early. And he will be back and start things up as quickly as possible so as to reduce the wastage of your time as much as possible. I have to go and vote. I will return as quickly thereafter as I can. Uh, the first step, I suspect, when Mr. Wyden comes back will be to commence the process of questions. Uh, and then we will proceed to recognize members in order of their appearance and seniority according to the rules. Uh, we will therefore adjourn for about five minutes. Is that acceptable to you, gentlemen? Thank you. The committee will stand in recess for about five minutes. Subcommittee will come to order. Mr. Eckhart, let me begin with you, if I might. You provided the subcommittee staff with a copy of an article appearing in the September-October 1987 issue of Transfusion. Let me ask uh, of our witnesses, this is a scholarly publication of the blood industry, is it not? Uh, yes, I believe it is. Let it be entered into the record at this, uh, at this point as Exhibit uh, H by the staff. In this article, and I quote, the authors state, we estimate that 29,000 transfusion recipients of all ages from these years received a unit of blood infected by HIV and that approximately 12,000 of these are still alive. These people are at risk for AIDS or AIDS-related conditions and may also transmit infection to others. Mr. Eckhart, is this estimate based on data compiled by the CDC? I, um, my recollection of that study, uh, Mr. Wyden, is that it's based on a mathematical estimation procedure. I think they uh, took certain data that were known to them and, and made an estimate of what the, um, what the outcome would be. Yeah. Let me also note, uh, because this document is being placed into the record, that at the bottom of page 371 it states that it was based on the AIDS program, Division of Viral Diseases and Division of Host Factor Centers, Center for Infectious Diseases, Center for Disease Control. Does, uh, does this estimate, Mr. Eckhart, to the best of your knowledge, include hemophiliacs? I don't think it does. All right. During the October of 1989 meeting, and this was the meeting of the FDA Blood Products Advisory Committee, Mr. Eckhart, there were extensive discussions regarding the re-entry of donors, were there not? Yes, that's right. Explain for us, if you would, what uh, donor re-entry is. Well, uh, Mr. Wyden, this is a procedure whereby uh, a donor who has been deferred by uh, blood tests is later uh, re-entered or allowed to uh, go back into the donor pool based on certain criteria, based on um, uh, new tests, based on coming back to the blood bank um, uh, after a period of time, additional testing having been done. I can't uh, recall uh, to you today the, um, the precise rules of that, uh, what they call the algorithm, which is the, the sequence of, of uh, decisions that are required for that to occur. It's quite complex, and the right. issue is that it was being, uh, a, a, a new algorithm, a modified algorithm was being proposed that day. Let me ask, uh, ask you this. Now, this data, according to the article, was based on the period between 1978 and 1984. The article was written in uh, Transfusion in uh, the fall of 1987. Is there any estimate as to how many people, donors, might be involved uh, as it relates to this population group? The donors of the right. 12,000 people right. who right. are presumably still alive and infected, right. I, I, haven't, I haven't seen any. Is there a significant industry concern uh, uh, about uh, this matter? Uh, uh, has there been extensive discussion uh, uh, among the industry as to how to handle uh, this group? Well, I, I, I'm not the person to ask uh, that of, Mr. Chairman. I don't. Uh, 
I'm not. Uh, privy to the industry's uh, who, who would? debates. How well, about I think, how I think they? I think it would be suitable to ask the industry that question. How about but some of our other panel members? Has there been significant industry-wide discussion about the possibility of those individuals cited in the 1987 transfusion uh, study re-entering uh, uh, as donors? Dr. Engelman? Any donor who is uh, identified as uh, a source of HIV uh, is permanently uh, deferred. Uh, that does not guarantee that that individual won't try to donate again, but uh, it's about as well as we can do in terms of uh, permanently deferring those people who are infected. Have there been steps to ensure that this population group is not donating? In, in my state, state of California, uh, the names of individuals who test positive for HIV is, uh, is sent to the state which has a statewide registry uh, to, to prevent this kind of incident. And do you believe that that kind of check exists nationwide? I can't say with certainty. I, I believe it exists for most of the nation. Mr. Ecker? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I did not realize that you, what you were asking what is the uh, what are the rules by which these people could become blood right. donors? I'm, I didn't in, right. understand your question correctly. I, I will ask other members on the panel, Mr. Brownstein, when one reads uh, of a study like this in an authoritative blood journal, and then uh, Mr. Eckhart describes the reentry uh, uh, of donors, the first question that comes to mind is whether or not there are airtight procedures in place to prevent uh, further donations. And I'm still not clear as to whether there are. Mr. Brownstein? Well, aside from the 12,000 donors that you made reference to with respect to HIV, uh, we don't think it's a good idea for blood donors to be donating blood because blood, uh, I mean, blood recipients to be donating blood. And I think in many areas, and I, I don't have the exact facts, but uh, blood recipients uh, are deferred from donating blood for a period of time. And I don't know if this is uh, based on state or national um, uh, recommendations. Uh, and anyone who receives blood can be subject to receiving any number of viruses that in turn can be passed on. Okay. Subcommittee staff has been told of a blood industry meeting held in San Francisco at which FDA personnel spoke. At this meeting, a senior inspector of the FDA was asked what FDA would require of the blood industry if donors tested positive for the hepatitis B core antibody. This inspector reportedly stated that the donor should be deferred and the blood should not be used for transfusion. In the afternoon, according to what the subcommittee has been told, the senior FDA official from Washington got up and told industry representatives that they had been misadvised and that donors testing positive for the B core test did not have to be deferred and the blood could be used. Let me ask you, uh, Dr. Engelman, and you, Dr. Conant, whether you are familiar with this incident and whether you could provide any details. Dr. Conant? I'm not familiar with the incident you cite, but it, it is strange. And let me try to clarify it by pointing out what the blood industry has been doing for years. It, it is known that an individual uh, whose behavior put them at risk for getting hepatitis B could acquire a number of other diseases, cytomegalovirus that Dr. Dr. Engelman mentioned earlier, and AIDS. The blood industry has known that and has acknowledged it for years. And if a donor goes in and gives a history of having had hepatitis B, that donor will be deferred and deferred permanent. But only half of us who've ever had hepatitis B know that we've had the disease. Many people are infected with hepatitis B, recover, and have no clinical symptoms. Those individuals will test core positive even though they have had no symptoms. And yet the blood industry will take blood from those individuals, or would up until 1986, because they uh, were not doing the core test to eliminate people. In other words, they had a way of being more stringent in their evaluation rather than just the patient's history, and they weren't using it. Okay. Dr. Engelman? Well, I, too, am not familiar with that specific incident, although I certainly had heard of it. Um, uh, par pardon me. You, where did you hear of it? Gosh. Um, 
I was aware of it during the past six months. I can't tell you where I, where I heard of it. But the point I was trying to make is that um, the issue of using the hepatitis B core antibody test is one that uh, our industry failed uh, to apply soon enough, not only because it's of its documented value as a surrogate test for AIDS, but also because we have known for some time, even before the AIDS epidemic uh, began, that, um, that that test, had it been used, would have reduced the incidence of non-A, non-B hepatitis, which is a much more common problem than even hepatitis B in the transfusion recipient. And it was not until 1986 that the core antibody test was recommended for widespread use. Uh, and uh, it's a pity, because uh, it would have worked. Do uh, any of our other panel members have any information on that? I, I, uh, I'm also concerned about the fact that uh, one hand of the FDA says one thing in the morning, and the other hand of the FDA says uh, something else uh, in the afternoon. I gather, Dr. Engelman, uh, this report is fairly widely known throughout the blood industry? Well, I think, I think it should be emphasized that the entire industry is using the core antibody test, and a positive test does result uh, in the deferral of a donor who tests positive. Uh, so regardless of what that official might have said, and it's regrettable, um, the industry is using the test, uh, finally. Let me see if my colleague can get some in before our vote. Gentleman from Virginia. Uh, Dr. Conan, during and after January 1983 CDC meeting, the blood industry suggested further studies of surrogate tests to identify the donors in high-risk groups for AIDS. Indeed, as Dr. Uh, Bovey's letter states, one of the apparent strategies to avoid unwanted testing requirements was to buy time by studying the matter to death. One study conducted by the Irwin Memorial Blood Bank in San Francisco reported that the rate of anti-B core positive among homosexual donors wasn't very high and also wasn't very different than the rate among heterosexual donors. What was wrong with this study and what would you have expected the results to show? Uh, I, I would characterize the study as, as poorly, poorly executed. And let me take a moment and explain to you how it was done and what it showed because that study was used by the industry to say that they didn't need to do surrogate testing. Uh, they decided that they would go through San Francisco and decide by zip code which areas had large gay populations and which areas had low gay populations. And Dr. Uh, Perkins, who ran the blood bank, was told, erroneously, that 100 percent of the people living in the Castro district of San Francisco are gay. That's not true, but it is a very high proportion. And he was told that numbers of people living in other areas of San Francisco were basically heterosexual. It was known at that time, known and accepted, that if you go and test a heterosexual population, 5% of them will test positive for hepatitis B core. And yet 75% of gay men were testing positive to core. So the hypothesis of the study is if we look in a straight community, 5% should be core positive. If you look in a gay community, 75% should be core positive. He did the study. They linked the test to zip codes. And they found that in the straight communities, 5% were core positive. But in the Castro district, 9% were core positive. Now, there's something wrong. You're, you as a scientist expect to find 75% and you find 9%. Dr. Perkins has testified that they didn't believe the data, but at that point they decided that, quote, those kinds of people who would get AIDS wouldn't come to the blood bank they threw out the data, and they quit doing surrogate testing for another year. The tragedy is that of the 10,000 donors they tested, they lost or do not have the data on 2,000 of them. In other words, they lost 20 percent of their data, which may have well represented the group uh, under scrutiny from the Castro. We don't know what happened to the data, but it was a poorly done study. Any good scientist finding that the results of his experiment did not agree with his hypothesis would go back and continue to test it until he could explain the discrepancy. Thank you. Uh, I would, since I mentioned Dr. Bovey's letter, I would like to ask unanimous consent to include it in the record at this point as Exhibit C.
if the 2,000 results that were lost were all or nearly all positive, would the study results be more what, would we, what we would expect? The, yes, sir, the answer to that is yes, uh, but good science would not uh, no, they, condone they, they, they speculation. The but clearly, you don't accept the results that of a study that important when you've lost a fifth of the data. But yet, despite the obvious problem with the study, it was cited as an argument against anti-B core testing, wasn't it? Yes, sir. There were only three studies done, one in New York, one in San Francisco, and one in Arizona. Each of the three was flawed in a different way, and this was one of the seminal studies that was cited that core testing was not necessary. Uh, so that leads me to my next question. Uh, any of the panelists familiar with the anti-B core results of a study that the New York uh, Blood Center did, which asked uh, donors to indicate whether their blood should be used for research only or for transfusion? Uh, yes, sir. I'm very familiar with Dr. Pendike's study. Was there something wrong with his methodology? Hers. Yes, sir. Um, in, in Dr. Pendike's study, the, the, the interesting thing is that the way the stu that study was constructed is donors came in and they were educated about AIDS far more intensively than in other blood banks, and then they were told to indicate whether their blood should be used for transfusion, indicating that they thought they were safe to give blood, or whether their blood should be used only for research, indicating that they thought that they might have a risk group, such as homosexual behavior or IV drug use. They found that high-risk donors coming in, well-educated, uh, did, did uh, exclude because there was a high prevalence of hepatitis B core positivity. But they also found that very few high-risk donors were coming in. So while the conclusion of the study was that hepatitis B core testing would be a useful way to pick up high-risk donors, they pointed to the fact that there were very few high-risk donors coming in, and they said that their public education to get people at risk to self-defer was enough, and they didn't need to do more. But what they didn't point out, except in the fine print, if you only carefully read the article, was they had had an intensive media blitz in New York preceding, immediately preceding the study and going on during the study so that high-risk donors were being intensively educated right at that point. Now, they did not continue that media blitz after they did their study, and other blood banks around the country did not have that type of media blitz. Furthermore, they showed during their study that as a result of the media blitz, the number of male donors from New York City dropped by 12 percent. So other blood banks could have looked at what they were doing, Irwin Memorial in San Francisco could have said, have our male donors dropped after 1983 as an indication that people were learning that there was AIDS in the blood supply and they should not come in. Uh, the blood banks didn't do that, do that. So they had a way of testing the results. They didn't do it. The Pendike study shows that core testing would be effective they erroneously concluded it was not necessary. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen of the panel, some questions. Um, Professor Eckert, according to scientific studies uh, cited in the 1985 book entitled Securing a Safer Blood Supply, page 18, between 210 and 381,000 persons, that's 210,000 to 381,000 persons, could be expected to contact hepatitis from blood transfusions annually, most of which was non-A, non-B type hepatitis. Is this not correct? That's, <coughs> pardon me, that is correct, Mr. Chairman. That, st that book was published in 1985, so that was an estimate based on uh, the source that was, that was used for that estimate would have been pre-1985. Now, in 1985, there was no direct test for non-A, non-B hepatitis, was yes, there? Yes, that's correct. But there were several surrogate tests available at that time which could identify a significant percentage of non-A, non-B hepatitis. Yes, Is that's that correct. So? That's correct. Now, the anti-core B test had been available since 1976. Now, what is your belief with regard to the primary reason as to why the blood industry did not adopt this test 
and thereby reduced by thousands the number of cases of non-A, non-B hepatitis passed via transfusions each year. Well, the literature that I read, of the, the trade literature that I read, uh, was always emphasizing the number of donors that they would lose. And uh, these tests, remember, were not perfect. They would reject some safe blood. Uh, and the industry was very concerned about the cost of replacing and the effort and the cost of replacing the uh, donors who would be rejected by the test. How would you and the other members of the panel weigh out that cost versus the risk to recipients of this blood of receiving non-A, non-B hepatitis or other uh, diseases by reason of failure to appropriately and adequately test that blood? Well, Mr. Chairman, as I said in my statement, uh, I quoted a, a, a cited of the study that was published in 1984 in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which uh, analyzed the costs and benefits of the ALT test, uh, which is a somewhat different, uh, a different laboratory test than the, than the hepatitis core antibody test. And that study, that analysis concluded that um, surrogate testing with the ALT test would be cost effective. Uh, taking into account the extra solicitation of donors that would be required, but before considering the lost wages of patients. And of course, if somebody gets sick from one of these diseases and has a hospitalization and has um, uh, um, some period out of work, the lost wages are, is, are an absolutely relevant factor that should be taken into account. Uh, the full studies for that period haven't been done, but it's my estimate, and based on uh, very straightforward, back-of-the-envelope sorts of calculations that I have done, that I think if the accurate, if the full studies are ever done, it will be shown that core testing and ALT testing would have been cost-effective uh, for hepatitis alone. Uh, to say nothing of the, uh, their value as a surrogate marker for, for AIDS. I observed you nodding one way or another. Do you want to tell us what your thoughts are on that, please, sir? Mr. Dingle, as, as a practicing physician, if I had said to you, you know, we're going to have to start doing core testing. It's going to cost about $5 a unit to do every unit. And probably for every patient of AIDS, with AIDS we identify, we'll have to throw away 20 units that weren't infected with AIDS. So that's going to add another $5. Which would you rather have, a transfusion at $100 or a transfusion at 110 which, which has had the best screening we have available for AIDS? And from my experience, from 28 years of practice, I don't think I'd have a single patient who would have said, oh, I'd rather have the cheaper blood. I, I concur. Is, any comments of the panel? Dr. Dr. Ratnoff, you were having some small chuckle at this. You want to give us a comment? Uh, well, uh, I presume that the, that the inertia on the part of the blood banking community, of which I am not a member, uh, may have been much more the question of the decrease in the number of potential donors than in their being uh, uh, concerned about the cost. Uh, if you don't have donors to, to uh, give blood for patients, it doesn't matter how much you were at cost if there isn't any blood. And I really shouldn't be speaking for them because this is way out of my uh, 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 knowledge, except from hearing them at some of these meetings. But I would think it was that which motivated uh, the inertia about uh, surrogate testing, a fear that they would not have the blood supply that was needed for the care of patients. Um, I gather this would be generally the consensus among the panel, Dr. Brown, or Ms. Brownstein. Uh, I too do not have a knowledge uh, directly of what the blood bank is, how they felt about it, except that I heard reference to the costs that are involved. And that is why uh, in my testimony earlier, uh, I made the representation that where new blood products are provided, or for that matter, wherever new safety measures are provided, uh, there needs to be the public commitment to support whatever the cost may be, 
uh, when it becomes a matter of, of a question of whether we're going to spend the dollars or have safety. Dr. Engelman, do, did you want to add any comment? Well, I think that a number of reasons were cited, uh, certainly when the subject of hepatitis B core testing as a potential surrogate for AIDS was considered, there was cost, dollar cost, loss of donors that were concerned about, uh, the fact that the test wasn't perfect, so in addition to identifying high-risk individuals, there were going to be some individuals who were identified who probably were not high-risk individuals. The problem, though, that I have with all of these concerns is that by comparison to the overwhelming concern that should have been about protection of the blood supply, um, these pale. And it's extraordinary to look back in retrospect, at least in my view, and wonder how the decision possibly could have been made, even given the fact that there was going to be some loss of donors, et cetera. Because when, in fact, the tests were incorporated in 1986, we did not experience any massive uh, blood shortages. And all of that could have been predicted on the basis of the small percentage of donors that would have been, would have been affected in the first place. Mr. Mr. Chairman, there, there, were, there were estimates that there were three, four, five, six percent it varied from publication to publication and person to person, but that was the realm of the number of donors who were uh, expected to be uh, rejected by these tests, although um, conceivably more, the more tests you use, the more donors would be rejected. But then also it's true that some donors are going to be rejected by both tests. So the, I think the amounts that were being uh, under discussion were fairly small. If I could offer a, a somewhat different perspective on this problem, uh, it, might, it might be useful for all of us to just think hypothetically for a moment as to what a consumer might pay to reduce uh, the risk of hepatitis from, say, 1 in 10, which was a common estimate of the industry, hepatitis of all forms from transfusion, from 1 in 10 in the era uh, before surrogate testing to uh, let us assume surrogate testing cut it by, by half. Uh, hepatitis can be a, a really mean disease. Uh, what would a well-informed consumer do uh, if the cost is maybe three, four, five dollars extra per unit of blood? Well, we haven't asked many consumers. We would all have to just play this mental game in our minds to see what would we would do under the circumstances. But we know that most people buy fire insurance on their houses. Most people, uh, the likelihood of a fire on somebody's house is trivial any given day or year in most communities, but people buy it. Most consumers buy it. And they have a lot of uh, their assets tied up in their homes. And people who work have a lot of assets tied up in their human capital, too. And I, my guess is that most consumers, if granted the choice, would have been willing to pay this uh, relatively small amount. Now, gentlemen, without objection, the chair places in the record Exhibit F, a sworn affidavit from a lawsuit in New Jersey of Dr. Thomas Asher, PhD in bacteriology over some 30 years' experience in the blood community. Dr. Asher is the chairman of the board of Hemacare, manufactured blood products and was a member of the Board of Directors of the American Blood Resources Association from 1976 through 1989. In paragraph 8, Dr. Asher recounts his attendance at a November 1982 presentation by Dr. Bruce Evett of CDC, at which CDC presented data showing AIDS carriers could be identified by surrogate tests. This is again the same type of data that we've been discussing and the CDC presented to a larger group at the January 83 meeting already discussed here. Dr. Asher makes this statement, and I quote, published data had demonstrated that the major risk group for AIDS, i.e. male homosexuals, also had a very high incidence of history of hepatitis B. This had been demonstrated by numerous surveys over the previous three to five years, which had, established, uh, which had been established in public health literature. In paragraph nine, Dr. Asher recounts how his company decided to implement a surrogate test for an abnormally low lymphocyte level as well as requiring donors to state their sexual preference and then to examine them for swollen lymph glands. glands. He then makes this statement, and I quote, by 1984, blood which was not tested by one of the following three tests, uh, T4 slash T8 cell test, lymphocyte count, or hep hepatitis B core antibody was unreasonably dangerous. To not test blood by any of the above tests 
was unreasonable and negligent. Uh, what would your comments, gentlemen of the panel, be with regard to the last read statement or the earlier statement from Dr. Asher? I agree with it. Uh, Dr. Brownstein or Dr. Ratnall? No, I think that's reasonable. Fair statement? Mm -hmm. You agree? One has, one has always to, to put one's mind back to 1984, though, 83, and it, what seems clear now may not have seemed so clear then. And indeed, those are the data that Dr. Evett had presented to our Medical and Scientific Advisory Council, which were reviewed and supported in, uh, in uh, January of 1983. And, and in, in defense of hindsight from San Francisco as well as Los Angeles, the, we were publicly at the university calling on the blood industry to introduce surrogate testing in February of 1983. I think your record is a good one and a clear one. And, and, and I don't think you need to be sensitive about it, Dr. The, uh, and I was joined by the, the then dean of the University of, of uh, San Francisco, University of California Medical School of San Francisco, and a number of other AIDS experts. So it wasn't just me. It was a number of experts, acknowledged experts in the field, experts in both AIDS and hepatitis B calling for this testing. Uh, yes, I would like to just add for the record that indeed those data were presented in January of 83 and they were reviewed and supported by our MASAC, but supported that if verified, they, uh, our medical body thought there was more analysis that was needed because that was the first time we had seen such data. Thank you. The chair notes that the time the chair has expired. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McMillan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Gentlemen, we've used the, the word consumers <clears throat> on a number of occasions. Uh, what do we mean by consumers in, in this particular situation? Anyone? Patients. Well, the main consumer is the patient who uses blood. But the patient really doesn't make a decision about where the supply comes from and how it's been screened and tested. Well, it's, it's actually quite extraordinary that uh, it is the patient and the public in general that has brought the pressure to bear on the industry to make the kinds of fundamental changes that we've witnessed over the past few years. Well, I'm really thinking ahead in terms of, uh, of uh, exercising discipline. It seems to me the consumer has an intermediary, and that is uh, the physician or the hospital that's responsible for the use of the product. Uh, is there enough input from that perspective in terms of uh, uh, decisions that should have been made in the past or ways we should approach uh, addressing this in the future? Mr. McMillan, certainly if we look back, there was not enough input uh, from physicians. And in the documents that I have reviewed, both from California and from other states on the West Coast, physicians were being constantly reassured by the blood industry that the blood was safe, and that the blood industry was, in fact, uh, educating donors and getting uh, high-risk donors to self-defer. And doctors were told over and over again, the chance of getting AIDS is one in a million. I think that had physicians seen the escalating number of transfusion-associated AIDS cases published, if they had seen the information being given to donors when they went in, if they had seen the extent or lack of extent of educational programs, physicians would have brought pressure on the blood banking industry uh, to do more. Let me give you a simple example. Again, as a practicing doctor, I can tell you that people engage in a lot of denial. They don't want to believe they're at risk for some terrible thing like AIDS. The information for IV drug users that the blood industry generally used stated something like, have you ever abused IV drugs? Well, I can tell you that most people who shoot drugs don't think they abuse them at all. They use them just right so they don't hurt themselves. So any practicing doctor would have told you that's a terrible history. What you've got to say is, have you ever shot a drug into your vein? Because only if you are explicit will you eliminate the chance for denial and truly educate the donor. I don't think the doctors or the hospitals knew what the blood industry was really doing in the time period of 83 to 85. 
Well, I appreciate your candid answer on that. Uh, I, I think that uh, maybe the blood industry is, uh, <clears throat> is partly to blame for, for that, but I think perhaps it's much broader, it would seem to me. There, there's a lot of uh, education that hasn't been uh, transmitted with respect to uh, AIDS that, that perhaps still uh, exists out there uh, among professionals who uh, the public should expect uh, should know better. And um, it, it comes up in, in the course of debates on a whole range of uh, issues around this Congress, not just specifically this. And um, so your candor is, I think, uh, is important, and we need more of that. It's interesting to note that this is one of the few examples where we had a disease about which the public was at least as well educated as many physicians were. Uh, in addition, in, in response to this, I think, in the state of California, a, a law was passed in the past year called the GAN Act, which ensures that uh, physicians inform their patients of the alternatives for transfusion that they might face at the time of surgery. I believe this is unique to California, but perhaps it's a, a law that should be con considered for the rest of the country as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a, f a few more technical questions here. I think my time is expired. How much time have I got? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brownstein, you, you had a comment you wanted to make, and I think Dr. Ratner, and I think, gentlemen, you Excuse or other me. members of the panel who want to comment to, to the last points raised should feel free to do so. Well, I just wanted uh, to comment on the, the term yeah. con consumer and its implication, because it, the implication is that the consumer uh, perhaps uh, should be in a position uh, to exert more influence, and no one will quarrel with that. But as I pointed out in my introductory remarks, here the consumer, in, in the, my patients, the hemophiliac, uh, in fact uh, uh, refused to recognize the dangers presented to them uh, by the use of uh, material that could be and in fact probably was contaminated with the AIDS virus. And I regret to state that the Hemophilia Foundation backed him up. Uh, because their uh, early uh, recommendations were for the hemophiliacs not to change what they were doing, not to stop using uh, contaminated materials. Uh, they made an exception for this, that if you had a patient who had never been treated before, then use the individual donor cryoprecipitates. And so I think that one must be very wary before one uh, asks uh, an uneducated in that regard group uh, to make a therapeutic uh, decision. Uh, we see this now, unfortunately, uh, en masse in, in the uh, uh, patients uh, with AIDS who don't happen to have hemophilia, the, the great bulk of patients. Well, I would like to comment on that. Um, before I do, I would just like to comment uh, with respect to the role of the consumer. Uh, I think that the uh, consumer is a little bit removed. The consumer does not wake up in the morning and say, I I'm going to purchase a uh, blood donation today. Uh, I think that Dr. Eckert's uh, point about making that, uh, that enfranchising consume consumers who are heavy users of blood products is a very good one on, uh, with a vote on the Blood Products Advisory Committee of the FDA. I think that that is an excellent place where the consumer can have a voice, particularly people such as people <laughs> with hemophilia, um, sickle cell anemia, and thalassemia. Um, but uh, in response to uh, uh, Dr. Rat Ratnoff's uh, comment, um, the way in which the National Hemophilia Foundation is structured is that we have a prestigious panel called the Medical and Scientific Advisory Council, which I made reference to before. And they deliberated all the sci uh, over the scientific data, including the presentations that were made by uh, Dr. Evett to the Medical and Scientific Advisory Council. And certainly because Dr. Dr. Ratnoff is so highly regarded uh, by the hemophilia community. His views were certainly uh, well known to the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, members of uh, this medical body that met in January of 83. <coughs> Um, and uh, indeed, uh, part of his recommendations were uh, incorporated in the recommendations of the National Hemophilia Foundation, and part were not. And uh, the position that was represented was that of medical clinicians and scientists, not the consumers, although uh, there were uh, two consumers who were present and also the way we have our organization structured, ultimately uh, any position of our medical leadership needs to be uh, eventually ratified by the consumer leadership. Uh, but the, uh, it's important to remember at that time that AIDS was truly uh, an, an, an Andromeda strain. Uh, no one knew what it was. Uh, we did not know it was a virus, and we, I guess we referred to it as uh, the AIDS agent. And uh, this was well before, years before Dr. Gallo identified uh, what was then called HTLV-3 in his laboratory. Uh, with respect to the data uh, that Dr. Ratnoff made reference to earlier concerning the difference between the use of uh, cryoprecipitate and, uh, and factor VIII concentrates. Uh, the uh, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute funded transfusion safety study uh, does indeed look at the uh, data from different parts of the country. And uh, there is one place in the United States where the use of uh, cryoprecipitate is the dominant mode of treatment, and that is in Seattle, Washington. Uh, through the uh, uh, excellent care that's provided through the Puget Sound uh, uh, Blood Center. And the uh, data there uh, reflects that about, uh, that over 35 percent, and this is from the best of my recollection, I'll be able to provide you more details on this data, greater than 35 percent of the people who use cryoprecipitate there uh, are HIV positive in contrast with the data I shared with you earlier that 50 percent of the overall hemophilia population, largely overwhelmingly dependent upon factor VIII, uh, were uh, uh, infected. However, just consider that the clotting factor, the thousands the pooled clotting factor, the thousands of donations are harvested from throughout the United States and centrally manufactured, whereas the cryoprecipitate is local single, don single donor source material. Just imagine in, in some of the higher risk cities, other than Seattle, the higher risk areas that were identified early on, uh, New York, San Francisco, for example. People with hemophilia, adults with hemophilia, are subject to 600 to 800 units, 600 to 800 units of cryo during the course of a year, and that is, of course, if they have severe hemophilia. Clearly, the amount would have been much higher in these cities. And eventually, what we have found is that continued cryoprecipitate use equals the same amount of exposure as with the use of clotting factor concentrates, as is the case with the transmission of hepatitis. The transmission of hepatitis through uh, AH, uh, through the clotting factor and, and cryoprecipitate. The difference is a matter of time. The young children who use, let's say, only 50 units of cryoprecipitate, as opposed to the adult, who might use six to eight hundred, you know, and I'm talking about those with severe hemophilia. Uh, the young children, we might buy time by putting off the exposure. So the real difference is really the amount of units of exposure rather than uh, crowd precipitate or clotting factor. So uh, further, as Dr. Ratnoff mentioned before, we now have wonderful methods of inactivating the virus in the clotting factor concentrates, and these methods have proven to be quite successful. And now the clotting factor is quite safe, and thank God, through the studies that we are doing at the National Hemophilia Foundation, uh, there are no further uh, seroconversions with people using these new products. 
I, I see that gavel, Mr. Chairman, so I will sum up. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I think I've, I, I've made my point that, there's, that basically we see that there is very little difference between the chiral precipitate and the clotting factor. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Chair recognizes now the distinguished gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Rowe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, would you define surrogate testing for me, someone? Well, in the case of AIDS, uh, Dr. Rowland, the, the surrogate tests were tests for the presence of a finding, an abnormality that was common in individuals felt to be at high risk for AIDS, homosexual men, for example, IV drug users, for example, but uncommon in the general population, particularly uncommon in the general population of blood donors. Specifically, could you name a test for me? The T cell test that we okay. use, for example. Fine. Well, the, the anti B core uh, test and hepatitis B is a surrogate test. The antibody to hepatitis B core would be a surrogate test for non A, non B hepatitis or uh, HIV, yes. Right, okay, thank you. I just wanted to get that, uh, get that on the record. We, we've already been over this, but let me. Uh, let me go over it just briefly again. A meeting with the CDC in 19, January of 1983, the reports where there was opposition to this surrogate testing by representatives of the blood banking industry because of the cost and because of the fact that they thought they might lose donors rather than basing this on scientific principles, which uh, would you all agree that that uh, took place? It, it, part of your question, sir? It, it, rather than basing it on scientific principles, they based, uh, they, they based um, their reasons for not uh, further exploring this on, on loss of uh, uh, donors or the cost. Right. We, we are that. told that they were concerned about supply rather than safety and that it was cost and loss of donors that was the primary concern. Yeah. If, if everybody, if all if all collecting points did the same kind of test, that would, that would sort of neutralize itself out, I guess, and it, really it wouldn't, uh, so the cost would be even across the board, essentially. But I, I guess the thing that they looked at more was the loss of donors, the thing that they really feared uh, more than anything else. Mr. Chairman, I want to place on the record Exhibit C a report to the Board of the Committee on Transfusion Transmitted Diseases. It was dated January 24, 1983, by Dr. Joseph Bavay of the American Association of Blood Banks. I think we can put that in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Okay. Um, as I understand, the Red Cross and AABB and the Council of Community Blood Centers, between them, probably collect about 98% of the blood um, in the country. Let me read a statement from that, uh, if I may. Dr. Bavay seems to be more candid in this report. In the second paragraph, for example, he reports a new case of an infant in Texas who contacted AIDS after transfusion from a donor who has AIDS, uh, concluding this case increases the probability that AIDS may be spread by blood. Dr. Bavay continues by noting that the CDC may even have a few more transfusion AIDS cases, stating that, and I quote, the most we can do in this situation is by time. There is little doubt that in my mind that additional transfusion related cases and additional cases in patients with hemophilia will surface, unquote. But Dr. Beauvais then added this warning. We do not want anything that we do now to be interpreted by society or legal authorities as agreeing with the concept as yet unproven that AIDS can be spread by blood. Uh, the pretty plain language uh, here, it seems to be that AIDS is probably spread by transfusion. Uh, most, most cases are virtually certain, more cases are virtually certain, but maybe we don't want to really acknowledge that now at this time. Is that, uh, that, does that, do you, do you agree with that based on this, these statements from this uh, report? Uh, like, like you, Dr. Olin, I'm trained as a physician, not a lawyer, and I don't know what some of these words like conspiracy means, but I went to a meeting the month after that memo that you just read was issued that Dr. Bove spoke to us publicly as physicians at NYU uh, and told us that he had serious reservations about even the fact that there was transfusion-associated AIDS. And so he publicly was reassuring us that the blood banks were doing all that they needed to and that he doubted 
that there was transfusion-associated AIDS, and that speech is published. And yet we now have this memo where, as you say, he's pointing out that I believe that the best we can do is buy time, that he doesn't want anything that they do to be construed by society or lawyers uh, as agreeing with the concept. And then on page two, he says, I hope we are equipped psychologically to continue to act together. Uh, he's been in contact with Dr. Katz and Dr. Minotope and believes the three of us can act together to work out whatever new problems may arise. Um, that, that sounds like collusion. I just, I, I don't understand it. Yeah, I was going to read that, but you've already read it for me, so I Sorry about that. appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see my time expired, uh, Mr. Chairman, so uh, thank, you. thank you very much. The uh, time the gentleman has expired, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Engelman, uh, persons in the blood uh, banking community who advocated surrogate testing uh, to ascertain certain groups at high risk uh, for AIDS were apparently subjected to strong pressure from uh, blood collectors, including the Red Cross, and criticism from their peers. I, uh, I think you're aware of an affidavit uh, that the committee has uh, received from uh, uh, Dr. David uh, DeJong and asked that it be placed in the record as Exhibit uh, E. Do you have a, a copy of that uh, affidavit, Doctor? While you're looking for it, I'll, I'll continue and then we'll, we'll uh, proceed, uh, proceed after with that. According to uh, the sworn affidavit, Dr. DeJong and others at the Charity Hospital Blood Bank in New Orleans advocated the uh, hepatitis B core antibody test to reduce the risk of non-A, non-B hepatitis as well as transfusion of AIDS. However, as stated in paragraph 6, and I direct your attention to uh, paragraph 6, uh, Doctor, uh, he states in that, in that uh, deposition, quote, we were unable to institute the test at our hospital because the committees that were designed to make these determinations felt pressure, particularly from the blood industry, including the American Red Cross. The pressure that was asserted was designed to keep blood banks from straying from the course set by the blood industry, including the Red Cross, that, cor that course being to avoid the use of the core antibody test. Uh, now, Dr. Engelman, when your blood center began using a surrogate test, in this case a T-cell ratio test, were you subjected to such criticism uh, or complaints? Yes, we were, and quite honestly, we were very surprised. Uh, we did not necessarily expect the rest of the industry to immediately take up this test that we were using. On the other hand, we did not expect the negative reaction that, that uh, transpired. Could you be uh, a little more explicit on that? How did that negative react? How was that negative reaction? Uh, uh, how, do, how did that take place? Well, uh, we spent some considerable effort uh, encouraging uh, blood bankers to look at our test and uh, either adopt it or the subsequently adopt the hepatitis B core antibody test. And uh, statements made in the in the uh, press at that time suggested, among other things, that we were. We were undertaking our, 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 our testing as a publicity stunt, that we were creating unnecessary panic and anxiety, that AIDS really wasn't the problem that we thought it was for the blood uh, supply, uh, that uh, perhaps we were making some secret profit from doing our testing. None of these things were true. Um, it is my belief that at least part of that negative response reflected a a concern that everybody hang together and, and that a consensus be reached and that we all behave the same way. In our judgment, this is part of the problem, the problem of discouraging uh, innovations or uh, differing ideas so that everyone acts in unison. That can be a strength in some circumstances. In this case, I think it was a terrible, it contributed to the tragedy. Uh, doctor, in fairness to those folks, uh, we we're talking now about the early 80s. Uh, yeah. really before the public and even a lot of the medical community became uh, aware of the uh, AIDS epidemic. Uh, so that uh, in, in some way we're kind, those of us on the committee as well as those testifying, are somewhat using hindsight uh, in, in the kind of a context as we told you so and here's what happened. Um, my guess is that most of those people I would assume were acting what they, in what they considered to be good faith um, based on uh, the knowledge that they had. Is that a fair assessment 
Okay. Well, you may have disagreement on the panel, but in my, in my view, uh, they were acting in good faith and they were doing the best they could, but they were uh, blinded. They did not objectively analyze the data that was available. The notion, for example, that the risk of contracting AIDS from a blood transfusion was less than one in a million, that you've heard repeatedly here, was, was absurd. It was absurd at the time it was suggested, but it was never corrected. It was allowed to continue and fester in the public uh, uh, mind for two years thereafter. But I do believe that they were acting uh, with the best of motives. I see Dr. Conant uh, champing at the bit down here, Th so thank I'll you. give him a chance to respond. Um, with, without trying to impugn uh, the motives of the blood industry, I would disagree with your characterization that it was before the AIDS epidemic was, was well recognized. Um, I would remind you, sir. Either in the medical community and, and the public? And the general public. For example, when IV drug users were being reported with AIDS in August and September of 82, that's six months before the time that we're discussing here, Time, Newsweek, all of the uh, periodicals ran feature stories often with pictures of AIDS patients on the covers of the magazine discussing the epidemic, pointing out that IV drug users were getting the disease and it looked like it might be transmitted like hepatitis B and even suggesting that it raised the concern that it might be in the blood. That was four or five months before the first case of transfusion-associated AIDS was even recognized. Uh, and so it's not correct to characterize the epidemic as being uh, unknown or unrecognized at that point. It had been named AIDS by May of 82. We had already had 900 cases of AIDS in the United States by the time the first transfusion-associated AIDS occurred and uh, the disease was well, well recognized by that time. Dr. Kona, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Eckert? Mr. Oxley, could I just add that <clears throat> uh, I wasn't present at the uh, January 1983 meeting that CDC called in Atlanta and I haven't even, I haven't read a transcript of it. I don't know if a transcript exists. But I have read reports of it, uh, quite a few reports. And the way I would characterize that meeting was a public warning by CDC, which is the government's expert agency on epidemiology. These are the people who supposedly know most about epidemiology. And it was a bold thing to do, to issue a public warning. And we hear in the press and, and uh, in Congress and everywhere else a lot of criticism of government agencies that don't do their job rightly, but it seems to me that they ought to get credit when they do do their job rightly. And it seems to me that CDC did its job it issued a public warning. Uh, the Public Health Service then, in the document that I cite on page three of my prepared statement, by March 4th, 1983, the Public Health Service interagency group had concluded that the available, I quote, the available data suggests that AIDS is caused by a transmissible, transmissible agent, end quote, and quote, the quote, that was uh, uh, an MMWR of March 4. 1983. So by that juncture, the hypothesis, which was the reigning dominant hypothesis that AIDS was caused by a bloodborne infectious agent, was unmistakable, absolutely unmistakable. Um, I wasn't at the uh, events that Dr. Conant has characterized in 1982, but these um, events of ni early 1983 are, are, to me, are, are unambiguous and CDC did its job. So your argument is that uh, you don't think they were acting in good faith. You don't agree with Dr. Engelman here. I think they ignored a warning. Now, I don't know. Uh, good faith is, a, is a, almost a lawyer-like term. I don't know quite how to characterize that. But they ignored a warning. They chose to ignore a warning. This was a public warning. And they decided to take a different course of action. Dr. Kona, let me ask you uh, if you're familiar with a situation in San Jose, California, where the American Red Cross determined that it would be best to test for the anti-B core, and then that was later reversed. Are you familiar with that uh, situation? No, sir. Uh, Dr. Engelman, are you? It's, it's my understanding that the uh, Red Cross in San Jose actually did decide to adopt surrogate testing in 1984 and instituted the hepatitis B core antibody test. What is regrettable is that the rest of the, uh, the Red Cross uh, around the country, including those high-risk areas, 
around the country, Los Angeles, New York, parts of Texas, et cetera, chose not to, and the Red Cross as a whole chose not to institute core antibody testing. But I, I just want to emphasize that San Jose did so. San Jose is not a high-risk area. It's located some 50 miles away from San Francisco. And for those of you that aren't familiar with that area, it, it really does not constitute a high-risk area for AIDS, and yet they had the, the, the foresight, if you will, to to begin surrogate testing. It would have been nice if they'd begun it a year earlier, but at least they did begin in 1984. Dr. Conant, uh, can you describe the events through which the uh, University of California at San Francisco faculty uh, forced the Irwin Memorial Blood Bank in San Francisco to adopt the anti-B uh, core test in uh, 1983, I believe? <clears throat> I'll tell you the events, sir, but I'm not sure we forced them to do it. Following the CDC meeting, uh, where no consensus could be reached, uh, by the blood industry as to what should be done, and yet where, from our perspective, uh, the CDC was urging the, the blood industry to use surrogate testing by showing them how effective it was on slides and in presented data. Uh, we, I invited uh, Dr. Perkins, the head of the blood bank in San Francisco, to meet with us at our AIDS clinic in San Francisco and discuss what the blood bank was going to do. Uh, he reassured us that they were going to screen out through questioning high-risk donors that presented at the blood bank, uh, but that they had no plans to institute surrogate testing. We urged him to institute surrogate testing because as physicians, we knew that there were people in San Francisco who were engaging in high-risk behavior, such as homosexual activity or drug use, who wouldn't admit even to themselves that that's what they were doing, and that we saw that educational efforts would always fail and that you had to have a backup screen, such as a surrogate test of the product once you had collected it. When it became obvious that Irwin Memorial Blood Bank was not going to act on that recommendation, a group of us, including Dr. Paul Volberding, uh, who now runs the AIDS program at San Francisco General, uh, Rudy Schmidt, who was the dean, uh, Dr. Altman, who's an internationally recognized authority on hepatitis B and I and some others, drafted an open memo to the San Francisco Chronicle publicly asking Irwin Memorial to look at surrogate testing uh, to try to eliminate AIDS from the blood supply. Unfortunately, they didn't do that at that time. They only did it in May of 84. This time that I've just referred to was February of 83. It took them a little over a year to institute surrogate testing. And we were told at the time that the reason they were doing it was not because they thought it would be effective for aid screening, as events have shown that it would have, but in response to what Dr. Engelman was doing down the peninsula at Stanford, because patients getting injured in San Francisco were going to Stanford for their surgery rather than having it in San Francisco because the patients knew that we had an AIDS epidemic and that it was being transmitted in blood. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, I'd like to sort of complete the record with a very fine list of questions raised by the gentleman from Ohio. Um, Dr. Engelman, uh, I'd like you to refer to San Jose. Uh, there was a decision made by the blood bank there to not require further tests. Ra rather, well, there the were two decisions made. One was to require additional tests, and then one was not to require additional tests. And I wanted you to comment on on, on, on that event. Um, they originally decided they were going to have additional tests. They came to the conclusion they would not. Uh, subsequently, uh, they did not. Uh, can you tell us whether the American Red Cross had any part in, in the change of decisions there? Well, it's my understanding that, in fact, the San Jose uh, Red Cross did institute the surrogate testing. I suspect they did so over the loud protests of the National Red Cross, but it would be, I, I would ask and suggest that you ask the Red Cross about that. How is it that one of their blood banks in a non-high-risk area uh, instituted surrogate testing when uh, the remainder of the blood banks, particularly those in high-risk areas, did not? But it is my understanding that, they, that the San Jose Red Cross did institute the hepatitis B core antibody test as a surrogate test for AIDS in 1984. I see. And, and was there pressure placed on them in connection with that decision one way or another by the American Red Cross? I don't have first-hand knowledge of that, but I would be surprised if, if there weren't uh, pressure. Very well. Thank you. Pardon? Yeah. The chair is going to recognize counsel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I wanted to clarify one point here. Dr. Engelman, when your blood bank started this T4, T8 test, 
did you in fact identify any donors who were excluded as a result of that test that had donated blood at other Bay Area blood centers? Absolutely. Uh, we started uh, our screening test in July 1, 1983. Within a matter of a few weeks, we had already identified individuals. Among the individuals who had abnormal T cell tests were those who should not have been donating in the first place, members of high risk groups for AIDS, specifically homosexual men, who when asked why did they donate blood when they knew, didn't they read the information that they weren't supposed to, they said yes, but for whatever reason they didn't think they were in that category of risk. Um, now some months later, in the winter of 1984, I believe it was February or so, uh, I received a phone call from a physician in elsewhere in California who uh, was very upset because one of his patients who had AIDS and in fact was dying from AIDS had told him that he had donated several blood banks, including our own, and was concerned now about the possibility that, that, that he had transmitted AIDS. As it turned out, that particular donor had donated at Stanford, but his T-cell test was abnormal and his blood was thrown out and not used. On the other hand, the same individual had donated at other blood banks and his blood was in fact used. He, he had donated at approximately 12 blood banks, is that correct? I, uh, at least 12 or so donations. I don't know whether there were 12 different blood banks, but there were several different blood banks, yes. And, and Stanford was the only one that rejected the blood? That's my understanding, yes. Why, why did Stanford reject the blood in that instance? We rejected it on the basis of uh, we were using a surrogate test for AIDS and that individual tested abnormal abnormal on that particular surrogate test and on that basis we rejected his blood. And was that, was one of the blood banks at which this donor gave blood the San, San Jose blood bank? I believe so, yes. Was that part of the reason why the San Jose blood bank decided that they had better have a surrogate test? Well, I would, if I had been in their shoes that would have been a good reason, as good as any. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Gentleman from Oregon, Mr. White. Thank you. Gentlemen, I think what concerns me the most uh, at this point is that we've discussed a number of questionable practices that took place in the middle 80s. And the question really is, which ones of these are taking place today? Which ones do we most have to move to uh, in terms of initiating reforms? And one area that I want to explore with you is what's known as the look back issue the notion that uh, a blood collector ought to test their inventory when a new screening test is implemented to advise a recipient based on the latest information as to whether they got uh, contaminated blood. Now, Professor Eckhart, in March of 1985, when the first test for the AIDS antibody became available, blood bankers began testing new donations but as a general rule, did not screen the blood on their shelves. Is that correct? I believe that's correct as a general rule, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Would Mr. A, would a look-back program at that time have likely prevented the transfusion of some AIDS-contaminated blood? Um, Mr. Wyden, if I could um, uh, elaborate just a bit. Uh, the question uh, that you raised uh, contains really two issues. One is this business of whether uh, the blood banks, when they received their early test kits shortly after the test was licensed by the FDA, should have tested inventory already on the shelves, previously donated units already on the shelves, as well as inventory shipped, I presume, shipped out to blood banks that had not been tested, all before routine testing of new donations began. And that's one issue, and uh, I don't believe um, most blood banks did that. Okay. The other issue you've raised is this issue of look back, which is when a person who comes into a blood bank and is identified by the, and a, the test for antibody to HIV, as being positive, the blood bank then looks back through its previous records of donations for that person and contacts the hospital to whom, to which those, uh, that unit or those units of, of blood or components were shipped. Um, I think look back is a, a, is a very important matter. 
the, uh, uh, because after all, we're dealing here with an infectious disease which could be spread not only from the transfusion recipient, but to, uh, to uh, others and, and members of uh, the family. Uh, the Presidential Commission on the HIV Epidemic cited that as an extremely uh, urgent and important matter, and, it's, and I agree. Well, wouldn't it be fair to say then, Mr. Eckhart, and panel members as well, that at best our policies with respect to looking back are uneven? I note, uh, for example, when the blood industry uh, instituted a test for hepatitis C uh, earlier this year, uh, Professor Eckhart, you were one who argued that there should be a look back in that case, as I understand it, and it wasn't done. I, I did. Uh, Mr. Wyden, and I argued it very strongly. I was uh, absolutely startled by the, uh, the uh, what, what appeared to be a consensus uh, reached uh, in, in various, uh, um, not, not only among the, the blood banking organizations, but a, in, a, in a, I believe, it, uh, a working group in the various health agencies that included FDA and NIH and whatever had met and had recommended that uh, we not look back for hepatitis C. That seemed to me to be a very uh, um, startling development in the following sense, that they were relying on physicians to contact patients rather than letting uh, blood banks notify hospitals each time a donor who was who tested positive for this test um, came in. Many patients don't know they've been transfused. I, I think what concerns me the most is that if you look again to the middle 80s, you see how the look back policy might have made a difference. You described just even those few months as the AIDS tests were coming online. And yet here we are right at the present period where we still don't have clear, uniform look-back uh, policies to strengthen our blood supply. Isn't that correct, Dr. Conant? To, to illustrate your case, sir, I know of a situation in the state of Colorado where the test kits became available. The unit of blood was already collected and was not tested, went out to a hospital and was not used, returned to the blood bank, was still not tested, went out to the hospital and was transfused into a young mother who is today dying of AIDS. So it, it not only is hypothetical, it did occur. Do Dr. Engelman, did you want to add anything on that point? Well, again, I want to reiterate uh, Dr. Eckert's comments that we're dealing with two issues. One is the testing of blood uh, in storage, if you will, in inventory uh, after a test becomes available, rather than just using the test to test new blood as, it, uh, as donors donate. In my view, there is no excuse for not seeking to test blood that has not yet been transfused just because it's in inventory. Uh, the, the issue of look back uh, refers, as you correctly pointed out, to incidences where an individual comes in to donate blood and tests positive on a test and you go back or you look back to recipients of this individual's previous donations. We now do look back for HIV. We don't, or the industry has not uh, yet begun to do look back for hepatitis C. I think there we could spend hours talking about the uh, difficulties of, of doing that. In my view, we should be doing a hepatitis C look back, uh, but it, as I said, it would take a long time to work out let me, all the Let me see if I can get one other question, and I know you want to add something, Mr. Ackard, but, but I think the basic point that I've wanted to make, you all have, uh, have uh, corroborated, which is that uh, some of the problems we saw in the middle 80s we're still seeing today, and here's a particular test, and I appreciate your clarity on it. Tell me if you would, uh, perhaps we start with you, Mr. Eckhart, in terms of the Blood Products Advisory Committee, is this an industry protection program? I mean, they seem to be very resistant to some of the proposals that are being discussed. Now, I do not profess to know more than what has come out at this hearing uh, today and the documents we have. But how would you characterize uh, that advisory committee? Well, that's an awfully strong way uh, to put it, Mr. Wyden. Um, I would uh, characterize it, I think, the way I 
I put it in my prepared statement and my... It, it needs to be opened up. It needs to be opened up and in my uh, remarks to the committee this morning. It is a situation where by the um, normal processes of the advisory committee of the advisory committee process, it winds up getting a lot more information from suppliers than from consumers. And I've emphasized this before. What consumers know about blood, about blood banking and what tests they should argue for and what they should pay for if they had the choice or right to make such payments is almost nil. Consumers don't specialize in this information. They expect the FDA, and they believe, I think probably most American consumers believe that the FDA is making adequate judgments here. Do so we get an advisory committee process that is structured so that the advisory committee and the FDA, the agency, gets a lot more information from one side of the market, if you will, than from the other side. And I think that's a, 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 a very serious deficiency. Could I add just a... A, a, a brief observation. Um, before coming to the committee today, I, I read the Federal Advisory Committee Act. This is Public Law 92463, uh, an act of 1972 as amended. And it appears in, and I'm reading from uh, Title V of the United States Code, the appendix, uh, Section 5. And it clearly spells out that standing committees of the House and Senate have, have authority to make sure as they consider legislation or as they consider other matters pertaining to the advisory committee process that the information that is generated by this process is, and I quote the statute, fairly balanced. Section 5B2 reads that they can require the membership of the advisory committee to be fairly balanced in terms of the points of view represented and the functions to be performed by the advisory committee. And that's where I took my language of fairly balanced in my statement. And I think it's just very important that Th those something th be done to restructure the, the balance of that advice. Th those are thoughtful comments. Let me just ask our panel members, we have a vote. Do any of you disagree with uh, Professor Eckhart's basic view? that the process needs to be opened up or restructured so as to provide for a larger consumer role and a vehicle for disseminating information. Is there any disagreement among our panel members on that? Let, let the record show then that uh, though there were no verbal answers, no one uh, gave a no to that. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, gentlemen, the... Uh, This thing gives me, tells me everything I want to know about what's going on, on the floor and a good deal more. Um, gentlemen, the committee thanks you for your very helpful testimony and your, and your, and your comments. Um, Professor Eckhart. Mr. Yes. Chairman, uh, thank you. Could I just make one uh, final remark? Um, a question that Mr. Wyden asked at the beginning of the question time, uh, the import of which I didn't uh, quite see, I think is a very important matter. He was referring to the number of, of people estimated by CDC who are still alive, the 12,000 who, as he asked the question, might be blood donors. And as I said in my prepared statement, I think it's very important that we reform blood donor screening practices to remove from the donor pool anyone who has been transfused since 1977 not only for the purpose of, of not transmitting HIV, but for the purpose of transmitting viral hepatitis, which from a public health standpoint, although it is not unambiguously fatal a disease, it is the much larger problem and causes each year, I would estimate, annual deaths that exceed all the transfusion AIDS cases to date. So this is, the, the issue that I, that I raised and that you were um, um, kind to let me emphasize again here, we need better donor screening practices, not just for those 12,000 folks, but for a lot more. Gentlemen, uh, I think in view of the fact that, that this, these are probably the last questions have been directed, do, do, do any of you like to feel that you should have anything else you'd like to say? Uh, Dr. Engelman, do you Yes, have just briefly, uh, we have made no mention today about the ability of many patients to donate their own blood and use their own blood, so-called autologous blood. 
which by definition is far and away the safest blood that one can receive since you don't become exposed to any agents that you aren't already exposed to. Uh, we have not used in this country nearly as much autologous or one's own blood as, as is possible and, and I think we should go on record as endorsing that concept and doing whatever can be done to make autologous blood uh, available to patients who can benefit from it. That is a more expensive way of doing business though, is it not? Uh, not, not much more. There is, a pro there is an administrative cost of setting aside one's own blood <clears throat> and making sure that it only gets to the individual that donated it. But in essence, it's really not substantially more expensive and it's a whole lot safer. So in the end, I suspect that we'd be saving money by avoiding uh, medical problems. I happen to think it's a very fine idea. I just, just wanted to be sure that, that we had that question on the record. Dr. Conant, do you have a comment, the last comment before we excuse the panel? <clears throat> Uh, I would like to second uh, what Dr. Eckert recommended, that I think that future medical historians looking back on this period, even today, will say that it's astounding that we continue to collect blood from individuals who have not been screened for lifestyle and behavior that may put them at risk for diseases that we have not yet even identified. And of course, some of those behaviors may not be socially acceptable, such as promiscuous uh, sexual behavior, so we might not want blood from prostitutes, but some of the behavior might be quite socially acceptable. I'm not sure we should be taking blood from physicians who stick themselves with needles all the time and are being exposed to a whole variety of agents. So I think that a more detailed uh, exclusion of donors uh, it would certainly be in the best interest of our patients. I'd like to conclude, uh, Congressman Dingle, by thanking you for having us come and uh, have an opportunity to share with you some of these concerns that many of us have had for a decade. Gentlemen. Um, Dr. Ratnoff or Mr. Brownstein? Well, the only comment I would make, uh, Mr. Dingell, uh, aside from uh, appreciating the privilege to uh, talk here, is that I think that uh, one uh, should realize that the blood products industry in terms of those that make clotting factors have become highly sensitive to the issue of transmitting disease and that they uh, have made uh, a much greater effort in this direction uh, than uh, perhaps they should have originally. And so uh, it, it isn't all a one-way uh, street. Uh, the uh, effect of uh, AIDS in the hemophilic population is not to be believed. I've uh, done two separate attacks on this. Uh, one has been uh, to say uh, what's happened uh, to uh, our own hemophiliacs who were transfusing themselves, uh, and uh, the answer is about a third of them are now dead with AIDS. And the second thing I've done is to uh, have a uh, study with a local statistician on every patient who ever has crossed our threshold with hemophilia or a hemophilic relative. And uh, there uh, the uh, result is absolutely extraordinary. The life expectancy of a hemophiliac uh, in uh, 1900, let's see if I've got the exact number here, in the beginning of this century, uh, the life expectancy was uh, about 40 years. And with the introduction of ways of treating hemophiliacs plasma and with fractions of plasma, such as I spoke of before, the life expectancy gain, jumped 20 years to 60 years uh, for severe hemophiliacs. And now we're right back to 40 or 10. So all the gains we had made have now been lost. Mr. Brownstein? Yes, I would like to just close and thank you for holding this meeting. I think that it is correct that some members uh, of the subcommittee observed that the blood supply has become more safe than it was, uh, say, eight years ago. Uh, I think that the risk that we face now is becoming complacent and not uh, maintaining our vigilance and making sure that this blood supply remains safe. And I would uh, like to uh, close by uh, uh, Mr. Wyden uh, uh, asked if anyone disagreed. I just want to strongly agree with uh, Mr. Wyden because in 1981 and 82, there was no one representing the hemophilia community on the Blood Products Advisory Committee. 
and today there is a physician and a non-voting consumer representative, and uh, uh, I have uh, directly observed that the hemophilia community has since become more enfranchised and involved and, 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 and been able to contribute more uh, to the uh, deliberations that are taking place here as a result of that. And again, thank you very much for holding this hearing. Well, gentlemen, you'll forgive me for hastening from the room because there's another vote on the floor, and you've kind of observed we have a curious process of running for votes and coming back and trying to do our business. Um, first of all, to each of you, our thanks. We greatly appreciate your assistance today. Your testimony has been outstanding, and I think everybody enjoy, uh, enjoys not only the greatest respect for you, but also uh, has the deepest gratitude to you for your assistance to us. These matters are going to be pursued responsibly by the committee, but I assure you vigorously. And I can also tell you that there will be uh, no one who will be forgetting the lessons of the past or taking the steps that need to be taken to assure safety uh, of our blood supply to everybody when these hearings are concluded. Uh, the committee will, the chair will, will adjourn the committee for approximately 20 minutes during which time uh, the chair will go to vote. The chair announces that immediately following that, the second panel will appear, and uh, everyone should plan their affairs accordingly. The uh, committee stands in recess then until 20 minutes after the hour of 2 o'clock. Okay. okay. Subcommittee will come to order. The chair announces that this is a continuation of hearings earlier held with regard to the safety of the blood supply and measures to, to assure that it is kept at the highest levels possible with regard to safety, quality, and lack of risk to the American people. The chair announces that we have uh, reconvened in response to the chair's earlier comments with regard to uh, the time at which the subcommittee would meet. The chair announces that our panel this afternoon is Ms. Mary T. Carden, a national expert on investigators on, on biologics for the Food and Drug Administration of the Buffalo District Office. Ms. Carden, we thank you for being present with us, and we appreciate your assistance to us. Good. Chair notes that you are accompanied uh, by Mr. Pitt Smith, who is the director of the Buffalo District Office. Mr. Smith, we welcome you and we thank you for being with us today, too. And we will look forward to such assistance as you choose to give to the committee as we proceed with our business. Chair uh, uh, Mr. Smith and Ms. Carden, the chair advises that it is the practice that all witnesses before the committee testify under oath. The chair inquires, do either of you have any objection to testifying under oath? No. No, sir. The chair advises that given that circumstance, it is your right to be advised by counsel should you so choose. Uh, do either of you desire to be advised by counsel in, in connection with your appearance today? No, sir. No, sir. Very well. The chair advises that copies of the rules of the House, the rules of the committee, the rules of the subcommittee are there before you in the uh, red and blue booklets which you see there at the table before you. The chair advises that uh, if you have no objection then, would you each please rise and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. I do. You may each consider yourself to be under oath, and uh, we will recognize you in such order as you choose to, oh, that's right. Chair advises, uh, the chair has been advised that you have no statement. So the chair will therefore recognize Mr. Sims, counsel to the subcommittee for purposes of asking questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would, I would obviously invite the members to interject at any point. Uh, the only reason that we were doing this is the lateness of the hour and uh, the fact that most of the questions are simply of a, of a technical nature. Um, Ms. Carden, how long have you been with the FDA and how long have you been a national expert? I've been with the FDA since September of 1978. Excuse me, could you pull the mic a little closer to you, please? I've been with FDA since September of 1978, and I started in the Orlando District Office, and I became the national expert in biologics in September of 1988. 
And I believe you're also an instructor at national uh, training courses and, and Yes, that's correct. Okay. Well, uh, let me say on behalf of the subcommittee that your reputation uh, precedes you, and we're very, very pleased uh, to have you with us today. Uh, could you provide us with uh, some background as to why you were selected to perform this investigation? I note that you're from the Buffalo region, but yet you performed an investigation uh, here in the nation's capital. And uh, perhaps in the, at the same time, you could explain to us why uh, the FDA decided that it should do an investigation of the, FDA, of the Red Cross National Headquarters. As the national expert, I'm located in the Buffalo District Office, but I actually work for the Division of Field Investigations in Washington, D.C., and therefore I do a number of inspections across the country. Um, one of the inspections that I've conducted in the past was of the Albany region of the American Red Cross, and that was at the request of Buffalo District. And as a follow-up to that inspection of the Albany Red Cross, I was then asked to conduct an inspection of the National Red Cross here in Washington. And as I recall, the Albany uh, Center was one that has had problems uh, discovered and uh, is either been shut down or is in the process of being shut down? The inspection that I conducted was began in December 1989. And as a result of the inspection, the American Red Cross was sent a letter of uh, notice of intent to revoke their license, or to institute proceedings to revoke that license. And to my knowledge, currently, the American Red Cross is going to shut down that region and consolidate the operations with the Syracuse region. Let me ask a, a general question here. Are Red Cross regional blood centers required to report errors and accidents to the FDA? Yes, they are. Uh, in your opinion, based on the findings of your investigation at the National Red Cross, did the Red Cross uh, make these reports promptly to the FDA? Not in all cases, no. Um, Ms. Cardin and Mr. Smith. Chair, I'd like to direct this question to you at this time. You said that they are required to report. They are required to report errors, yes. Uh, is that by FDA regulation or by statute? By FDA regulation. And that regulation is issued pursuant to statutory authority in the Food and Drug in I believe so. Administration? I believe so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And isn't it also true that the Red Cross's own internal operating procedures require them to make such reports? That's true. What, in your opinion, would be a prompt report, to use the term in the Code of Federal Regulations itself? My definition of prompt would be 10 to 15 days. But you found in your inspection, as it is stated, and let me ask Mr. Chairman that Exhibit K be placed in the record at this time, which is the summary of uh, your inspection. Without objections to order. You found that in many cases, errors were not reported to the FDA for a matter of months. Is that correct? That's correct. Some not at all. And you also found in many cases that at the time of your inspection, errors had not been reported to the FDA at all. Isn't that also correct? That's also correct. And in both cases, that would appear to be a violation not only of the Red Cross's procedure, but of your regulations. That's correct. What was the response of the Red Cross to your inspection? I could characterize the general overall tone of the inspection of very nonchalant. Um, in my 12 years of experience in inspecting um, the blood industry as well as the drug and device industry, generally when I object to something during an, during an inspection, uh, the firm is very prompt at trying to provide some information for me to show that they've already corrected the deficiency or are going to do the best they can. And in the case of this inspection of the American Red Cross at National Headquarters, that type of attitude did not prevail. Um, there were no promises of corrective action during the inspection. Um, other than the current Director of Regulatory Affairs, who's only been in that position for about three weeks at the beginning of the inspection, I did not see any expression of concern at all from anyone that I dealt with during the inspection. Did any Red Cross persons indicate to you that no matter how bad it was, your findings were, that 
you should have seen it in the uh, previous point in time that things had gotten better than they were? I'm sorry, I don't understand the did, question. Did any Red Cross persons that you talked to in the course of this inspection indicate that whether or not what you found was bad, things had been worse previously? Yes, in reference to my question about the lack the failure to uh, report the errors to FDA in a timely manner, I asked several people at Red Cross who were responsible for that why they had not been reported to see if there was any good reason. Um, the response I got from the person that was um, immediately in charge of the error reports indicated that those error reports were not her first priority. Another person I asked indicated that uh, he probably shouldn't say this, but the, the situation has been worse. And when I asked Dr. Barker, who's the responsible head for the American Red Cross, to whom this report was issued, he indicated that um, he had told them in, to get the situation corrected. And, um, and he didn't, um, I, what he indicated to me was he didn't intend for them to sit there, meaning the error reports, for the rest of their lives. Well, did you have a, uh, a formal meeting with the Red Cross officials uh, after your inspection? And, and if so, could you describe what transpired at that meeting? At the close of any FDA inspection, we always conduct a discussion with management. And we're required to issue this form FD43 that you've reviewed to the most responsible individual, which in this case was Dr. Barker. So I did hold that meeting. And at that time, uh, the firm had uh, many individuals, responsible, responsible individuals at Red Cross at that meeting. Uh, during that meeting, um, I, as required, explained what my objections were again um, on all the items that are listed on that form that you have, the FD43. And um, at this time, normally a firm will attempt to make some verbal response to me indicating we will get these items corrected or we've already done it. That type of response is normal. And what, what was the response of the Red Cross? In this case, they asked me, and I was with a supervisory investigator from the Baltimore District Office at the time. They asked us to leave the room so that they could discuss among themselves if they would like to respond at that time. And when we um, were called back into the room, we were told that they would like to decline to provide a response at this time, but would provide a written response at a later date. And you, based on the experience of your inspections, would you say this is usual or unusual? I would say that in 97.5% of the cases, a firm is, um, will respond um, during the inspection and certainly at the close of the inspection uh, o over any item that I might consider objectionable. In, in fact, you told us yesterday that, that on a number of occasions, in past inspections, uh, the inspected party has literally worked over all night to try to correct the, the deficiency that you discovered. Isn't that true? That's true. But that certainly didn't happen in this case, did it? Not to my knowledge. There was no demonstration of it in the, during the inspection. Now, when the, a, an error is discovered in a Red Cross regional blood bank, it is sent to the Red Cross national headquarters. Is that correct? Yes, as you know, all of the regional Red Cross centers are under one li U.S. license number, and all those error reports go from the region to national headquarters, which is a, a, an acceptable system in that national should see those error reports so that they can review them and analyze them in case corrective action is needed nationwide. And the national Red Cross is supposed to provide those to the FDA, is that correct? That's correct. Now, when a regional Red Cross blood center sends an error report to the national headquarters, does it provide a copy of that to the local FDA district office? No, they don't. Why not? I don't know why they don't. Do you think it would be a, a good idea if they did provide yes. a copy? Yes, it would. Would it, would it help you somewhat? Yes, it would definitely help. How would it help you? I'd have the error reports when I went to do the next inspection of that firm because when a district office received that error report, they would file it in the EI jacket for that firm. And then the investigator that was going to do the next inspection would have that immediately available to them without any delay. 
So it would help you when you did your annual inspection? Yes. If the district office did not comply with the regulation to send an error report forward, and in fact didn't create an error report, it would seem to me from what you've just said that there really is no way to double check that process. Is that, is that a, a not fair understanding of uh, the system here? You mean the regional ARC blood center? Yes. If they did not create an error report? One of the purposes of the inspection by the FDA investigator is to determine during the inspection if there were any errors and if those errors were reportable, were they sent into FDA? In this case, um, as if, if you're sitting in an, a regional Red, uh, Red Cross blood center, the only thing you can determine at that time is that that error report went to national headquarters. But if you had a copy of the error report, you could more quickly and more effectively check on the regional blood center, couldn't you? That's correct. And if they knew that you had a copy, do you think they would be more likely to promptly and accurately report these errors up the line? Well, I believe your first question was if they submitted it to the district office as well, all right? Yes, they don't that's submit. the presumption. Right. So you think that would be a good idea? Yes, I do. I think that what I have seen in some cases is that the regions are submitting the error reports to national headquarters, but national is not passing them on. You, indicate, you also indicated there is another problem if in that that region may not submit the error report to begin with. Mm-hmm. Mr. Smith, uh, as district director, do you know whether or not your district is getting all the copies from FDA here in Washington of the error reports that make their way to the FDA here? I don't, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know if we're getting all of them. We only get a few every year sporadically. So if your inspectors in the district got copies when they started up the line, you would certainly be more able to know whether you were getting everything through the headquarters when it came down the line. And this would be a rather nice double check, wouldn't it? Well, yes, and it would serve as a, as a prompt to us to conduct inspections. Mm -hmm. So essentially what we're talking about here is an honor system. Uh, would you concur in that statement? Well, I wouldn't um, characterize it as an honor system because during an FDA inspection, an investigator would be looking for any errors that had occurred. And that is the means by which um, uh, we would, hopefully we would find out that they hadn't submitted an error report. And when you did your inspection, as we will discover in a minute, you found, number one, the regions had not sent error reports to the national headquarters as required. Number two, the national headquarters had not investigated these reports as they should. And number three, the national headquarters had not sent the reports to the FDA headquarters as they should have. Is that correct? What was your first statement? I think the, the first The region had not sent the reports to. From, during the inspection of National Red Cross, I could not determine if some error reports had not been submitted to national from a region, but I could determine that they were delayed in coming from the uh, region to national ARC. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's turn now to the document itself and, and find out specifically more about what you found. Um, in paragraph one, we're talking about an error and accident report. Specifically, this case involves a donor whose blood tested positive for hepatitis. And this test was confirmed positive by a second test. Is that correct? It was confirmed positive, yes. Now, the blood from such a donor is not supposed to be used, even though it was used in this instance. Isn't that correct? According to the records that I uh, reviewed at National ARC, some of the products collected from these donors were transfused. Well, if a donor's blood is not allowed to be used, could you explain to us why the donor was allowed to donate? The regulations that FDA has allows, uh, if a donor is deferred, the blood can be collected from the donor. However, it cannot be distributed. Therefore, once it is collected, they must sort through which products were collected from deferred donors and which were not. So by allowing a deferred donor to continue to donate, 
even though the blood is not supposed to be used, this puts an extra burden on the accuracy of the accounting system, doesn't it? It does cause additional problems, yes. It also imposes extra yeah. well, as a matter of fact, it imposes extra risk, does it not? It poses extra risk in that if the person was deferred, um, you're exposing the people collecting the blood to diseases, yes. Thank you. What went wrong that allowed the blood components to be distributed in this particular case? I believe in this particular case, there was no deferral code on the donor's records in the computer. The report notes that while the error was discovered in November of 1989, as of your inspection in May of 1990, the Red Cross had not notified the FDA. Now, this is clearly a violation of FDA regulations which require such errors to be promptly reported, isn't it? Yes, it is. In this case, the regulatory affairs element in Red Cross headquarters had not notified the FDA over four months after receipt of the error report from the region. Now, you've said earlier that, in your view, a reasonable reporting time is something on the order of 10 to 15 days. Is that correct? Yes, it is. I think it's important to note that the, the Red Cross or any blood bank could inform FDA of the error without have it, having it fully investigated yet. But once they've released blood products that are unacceptable, that error report should come immediately to the agency. And of course, we would understand that it might take some time to investigate it to determine the cause. So the distribution of this contaminated blood product and the failure to promptly report the error were both violations of FDA regulations, is that yes, correct? Yes, that's correct. In paragraph two, your report notes that approximately 386 error and accident reports submitted by various regions had never been reviewed by regulatory affairs. Is this a violation of the Red Cross's own standard, standing operating procedures? They did not have a, a specified time in their own standard operating procedures in which they would review them. But reviewing them myself during the inspection, I determined that some of them had been there for quite some time, and therefore they should have been reviewed by them and passed on to FDA. Some of these were two years old, weren't they? I believe so. And they hadn't even been reviewed by the uh, regulatory affairs element, much less passed on to the FDA. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And so had no input in the policy. Uh, and so the FDA was absolutely unaware that these occurred, except if they had been discovered by an inspection of a, by, by a regional office. That's correct. And the practical effect of this was to delay the establishment of an adequate policy at FDA with regard to reporting, disclosure, uh, and levels of risk and peril and possible other curative actions. Isn't that so? I'm sorry, would you repeat that? Well, if food and drug is not getting information as to events which are occurring out there which are adversely impacting the safety of the blood supply, it has, it, it has lost the ability to make an adequate and speedy response to threats which might exist in the blood supply or which might be associated with the blood supply. Is that not the case? That is the case, Thank yes. You. Mr. Chairman, can I just ask one question at this, uh, at this point? Uh, this is very helpful. My, my question to you at this point is, in September of 1988, uh, the Red Cross and the Food and Drug Administration uh, entered into an agreement to address most of the issues that you're talking about. Is it your belief that the problems that you have found in your inspection violate uh, aspects of that uh, agreement? For example, just the first uh, section uh, stipulates that clear lines of control of the regional blood services uh, be established. Uh, to answer your question, yes. That, that what you found did violate that 1988 agreement? Yes. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wyden. Um, in paragraph 2A of your report, you note that 15 units with elevated levels of ALT were erroneously shipped to the Swiss Red Cross. Do we know whether the ALT levels were high enough to be dangerous or not? I think I mentioned to you without the records in the report in front of me, I, I'm not sure if that information is even in that error report. Okay, what caused this blood product to be mistakenly released? Can you recall that?
No, I don't recall what the reason was in this particular case. Okay. Did you see error reports that did not contain enough information in them so that you could tell whether the blood product was dangerous or not? Yes, that's true. Did you find error reports that did not contain enough information so that you could really judge the seriousness of the error itself? Yes. Did you find instances where the Red Cross headquarters themselves had to send the error reports back to a given region to get more information? Yes, I did. <clears throat> In paragraph 2B, the report describes an Atlanta donor <coughs> that should have had an XL code rather than an H code. Now, I understand that an XL code is a permanent deferral and that an H code means that the blood is to be held. Is that correct? That's correct. <clears throat> Can you explain how this mix-up happened? This was an error report that we asked them to explain for us during the inspection. And when the blood is collected and tested and you first receive um, reactive test results or you note any problem or suspect problem with the blood product, you would put a what they call a code H on that particular uh, blood product, which will, in the computer, um, prevent the product from being distributed. In this particular case, there was a what they refer to as a bug in the computer system, which had to do with the fact that there was a new decade, 1990 being the new decade. And um, what happened, because of the bug, an H code was posted to all of the products um, that they had collected. And I don't know whether it was in terms of a di in, in the same day or what it was. Okay, And in this particular instance, because of the bug in the system and all of the H codes that were on the products, they had to go in and manually delete those H codes in order to be able to distribute the product. And what happened is someone did not recognize the fact that one of those H codes was a legitimate H code. In other words, the product should not have been distributed. So due to the fact that there was a problem with the computer system, um, it caused that error. Now, the software system, as I recall, was one of the problems that the FDA had identified in previous inspections of Red Cross facilities around the country. And this was one of the subjects of the 1988 agreement that was supposed to be uh, fixed by the Red Cross. Is that your recollection? That's correct. In paragraph 2C, a donor with an HIV positive and a Western blot negative test donated and the blood was used. Is this a violation of FDA regulations? Yes, it is. You're not supposed to use that kind of blood. Right. So I, I presume that blood from an HIV positive and a Western blot test indeterminate, as described in paragraph 3B, uh, should also have been destroyed. That's correct. Now, uh, in paragraph 3E, your report states that the region was, the, the Red Cross region was told that a donor had been, quote, in contact, unquote, with an individual with AIDS. Uh, did the error report indicate what kind of contact this was? No, it did not. Did the Red Cross have to go back and try to request further information to figure this out? They had requested the region provide some additional information. And, and when you reviewed this case, could you tell whether or not the blood had been released and whether or not it was contaminated? I could not tell from the information in the error report. So the error report was deficient in detail? Yes. And, and neither you nor presumably the Red Cross could tell from the information that you saw whether there was a problem or not in, in terms of uh, infectious blood being released. Neither myself or anyone at National Red Cross, uh, the region may have that information. In paragraph 3F, a death in Michigan is described from contaminated blood. This had not been reported to the FDA some three months later. Obviously, well, what is the obligation of the Red Cross to report in this particular case? In this particular case, when they received information that there was uh, some type of reaction, 
um, including and as serious as death, they would be required to investigate it to determine if in the manufacture of the product they had done anything incorrectly which caused, the, caused it. And as a follow-up to that, um, complete an error report and submit it to uh, FDA. I might, a I, I might add in this particular case, I believe that the Red Cross re reported this particular error to the FDA verbally during the inspection. An amazing coincidence, no doubt. The next three paragraphs recount deaths earlier in this year due to bacterial contamination in the Chesapeake region. Yet at the time of your inspection in May, none of these three deaths from the same region had been reported to the FDA, isn't that correct? That's correct. Could this have been a potentially serious safety problem of which the FDA would have been unaware? Yes, it could. This is one of the concerns to me is the error reports are not reviewed at national and analyzed in terms of they should have recognized that there, there's something different here. There's three reports of deaths from, from one region. There's a lot of potential out there as to what could possibly have happened. It could have been one of the procedures they used. It could have been a contaminated a uh, lot of blood bags. It could be a hundred probably different reasons. And all coming from one region, should have, they should have recognized that and begun some analysis of that. So clearly we could agree that three deaths in one region from the same cause in a relatively short time is at the very least a cause for serious concern. It should have been reported promptly to the FDA and should have been quickly investigated. Yes, I'd agree to that. I think that one of the things I would like to add in this case is um, without looking at the records, in some cases after the investigation is conducted, um, you can determine that the product was contaminated and therefore was the cause of death or the product was contaminated or the product was not contaminated or at least you couldn't prove it was contaminated and you don't know what the cause of the error was or in fact you might be able to prove that it was not the product and, and I don't know the status in each of these without looking at the records. And this kind of information is absolutely critical to the question of whether you need to do an immediate recall or not. Would you agree? Yes, I would. And yes. if there were contaminated product and it was not recalled promptly, there is the, at least the possibility, if not the probability, of, of further uh, negative health effects, right? That's correct. I notice in your report that the SOP for handling error and accident reports at the Red Cross had not been revised since July of 1981. Uh, your ins inspection found that the SOP didn't require that a particular individual be responsible for reviewing error reports and it also found that a log or some other accounting system was not required to keep track of all these error reports. Is that correct? That's correct. In your opinion, did this contribute to the failure of the Red Cross to review regional error reports and pass them to the FDA in a timely manner? Yes, I believe so. When you have that many regions reporting information into you, I think it's critical that you have a, some system of tracking them from the time you receive them to the time that you submit them to FDA. And I might add that in terms of numbers, my understanding was that they might receive 100 a month and some of the other figures that they gave me where they may receive zero one day versus 40 on another day. So I think the volume is sufficient that they definitely need a tracking system. So this kind of tracking and accounting system is, is elemental to, the, to assure an organization's ability to keep track of the reports. Would you agree? It's basic quality control. And, and they didn't have that in place when you did your inspection? That's correct. Do you believe that this SOP should be revised and improved as soon as practicable? I certainly do. Do you know whether or not that work is in place? Not to my knowledge. You don't know whether it is or isn't? No, I don't. In general, would you say it's a fair statement to characterize the Red Cross record keeping system as inadequate? Yes. Well, as a matter of fact, food and drug uh, administration report and the Department of HHS uh, Public Health Service report indicated exactly that, did it not? I'm sorry. That, that the record keeping, the um, proper ma property management, the computer system uh, at FDA were all insufficient 
to meet the needs. Is that not so? Which report are you referring to? Your, um, your 483. My, yes. Yeah, it's the, yeah it's the, which, this is your report. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in paragraph 7, your report found that of approximately 230 reports of transfusion-associated AIDS reported to the Washington, D.C. region, only four cases were reported to the American Red Cross headquarters. Could you explain how your inspection discovered these 230 reports and exactly what the Red Cross records show? When we began the inspection, I was with a, two other investigators. One investigator was from the Baltimore District Office, and she had obtained a copy of a letter while inspecting a blood bank, um, which was from Red Cross, indicating they were looking for some units that had been distributed from a donor who was now anti-HIV, repeatedly reactive, and Western blot positive. In other words, they were looking for a unit that had been collected previously from him. We took that letter with us to National ARC and asked them what information they had about that letter. And their first indication was that they did not know about the situation. That particular situation or that product that was in question had been distributed by the Washington region. Should, should they have known about it? Yes. Please continue. After they did, since they did not have any records there, we asked them to call the Washington region and find out, get us some information about the situation. And they indicated that they had some records there and that they would fax them to National ARC. And the records that were faxed to us were approximately five pages of information. One of the pieces of information on one of the records said case number 169. Because it said case 169, we asked if there were 169 cases. Yeah. And they indicated that they didn't know, but they would ask. And they asked Washington Region, and their response was there were, I believe the number that I was given was 230. So they're just, counsel, counsel yes, just of course. Just a moment. I, I appreciate it. Uh, the Red Cross uh, on July 10th, Ms. Carden, put out uh, a statement. And one of the things that they said, talking about error and accident reports, uh, and I, I want to just quote to you, they call them, procedural errors which are corrected immediately at the local level and then routinely reported to national headquarters which in turn reports them to the FDA. Is that possibly a true statement? <laughs> Not to my knowledge. <laughs> if, if, if counsel would yield, how is that possible in view of the level of record keeping, computer capability and, and reporting that you found internally at the American Red Cross, and also with regard to the reporting, which goes on between the American Red Cross and Food and Drug. How is that, how is that possible? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't... Well, you found, first of all, you found internal deficiencies with regard to reporting. That's correct. At American Red Cross. Yes. You found sig significant failures by American Red Cross to keep proper books and records. That's correct. You found failure of American Red Cross to keep uh, an, an adequate and up-to-date computer service and system properly, properly maintained and, 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 and upgraded. Is that not so? That's so. Now, in, in view of those facts, how is it possible that, that American Red Cross could be uh, conducting the uh, program that they've indicated by requiring that the matter be reported quickly from the um, local units to the national headquarters and then from the national headquarters to the Food and Drug Administration. That's their statement. You'll have to ask them about it. In your view, it's, it's not possible. No. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess the, uh, the point of this 230 case example is that Red Cross National Headquarters really had no idea uh, about what had happened with these cases. Is that a fair statement? That's one of my main concerns. And as soon as they receive such a report in a region, they need to conduct an investigation. And there should be records of investigations for all of those. And they should determine if there was any error involved. And so, that error should then come to the agency. So as we sit here today, we really don't know very much about these 230 cases. Is that correct? 
I don't know very much about those 230 cases, but there are people in FDA looking at those currently. Although they probably know a bit more about them now than they did then. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to uh, gild the lily here. I, I would just note uh, in my last question that uh, <clears throat> it is true, isn't it, that your infection, inspection found uh, various problems with the computer software such that the Red Cross could not assure that the blood of deferred donors would be uh, stopped from being used. Is that correct? I think it would be better characterized with their uh, saying that there were serious problems with their usage of that computer system as a whole, rather than specifying just the software. So it's more than just the software? Yes. Those are all the questions I have, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, I think we have covered it. Just a couple of other quick uh, points, if I could. Uh, Ms. Cardin, uh, was the uh, Red Cross slow to come up with programs designed to identify blood donors who uh, are HIV uh, positive and identify those who might have given blood? Sure. I'm sorry, what are you referring to, programs? Well, one of, one of the allegations, as I understood it in the report, was that they were slow to come up with programs or initiatives to identify uh, uh, donors who are HIV positive. Is that correct? I'm, I'm not, I don't know what you're referring to. Okay. I can. All right. I, I was under the impression that that was one of the allegations you found. The only other point that I wanted to uh, ask is that uh, there is no question that a number of the matters that uh, turn up on your inspection report relate to current procedures. You know, much of what we have uh, discussed has come about in 1983, 1984, 1985. But what you are, are relating to are deficiencies that really uh, stem from activities in 1989 and 1990. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I think this has been, uh, been very uh, enlightening. We have uh, heard uh, information from uh, the FDA inspectors that the 1988 uh, agreement is, uh, is not being complied with. We've got information that would suggest that this statement put out by the Red Cross a couple of days ago is simply uh, inaccurate. And uh, I look forward to hearing from the National uh, Office of the Red Cross uh, uh, as to uh, uh, their assessment of some of these deficiencies, because uh, I thought that 1988 agreement was to clear up some of these matters, and it's quite clear that uh, they're ongoing. Chair, Chair's view of the gentleman. Um, the counsel for the minority. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bliley has requested that a series of written questions be submitted for the record. Without objection. Record will be kept open for the for the response to those questions and for the insertion of the questions themselves. Uh, Ms. Cardin, Mr. Smith, the committee thanks you for your assistance to us. I believe you have done an outstanding job here in carrying out your responsibilities. The chair wants to observe that from time to time the chair does have some harsh things to say to and about the Food and Drug Administration and the Department of uh, Health and Human Services. Certainly. Uh, you have shown a, an example of dedicated, decent, and competent service, which merits the approval of the committee and the commendations of the committee. And I would like to commend you both for what it is that you have done and also the way in which you have done it. I, we believe that you have not only been helpful to us in your testimony today, but also you have been helpful to us in knowing what the facts and circumstances might be and in taking steps will lead to an overall improvement not only in the regulatory actions of food and drug, the behavior of the American Red Cross, and others in the blood collection business, but also that you have given us the basis for appropriate action by this committee, which will be the subject of considerable activity on the part of the staff of the subcommittee and, and the members, and also ultimately on the part of the uh, full committee. We intend to see to it that uh, we first gather the facts and second of all, see to it that proper remedies, both private, administrative, and statutory, are taken vigorously. Uh, Ms. Cardin and Mr. Smith, we thank you for your assistance to us. The chair announces that if there is no further business to come before the committee, that the committee will stand adjourned until the call of the chair, at which time we will continue these proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. Well done.
That concludes this hearing on the safety of the nation's blood supply. We invite you to join us tomorrow evening for a look at the week's major news stories on Journalist Roundtable. Our guests at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 Pacific Time, will be Andrew Alexander of Cox Newspapers, Terry Atlas of the Chicago Tribune, and Ann Grower of the Orlando Sentinel. That's Journalist Roundtable, Saturday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Coming up next, a news conference with conservative leaders. Thank you.